So good morning, everybody. We will start in uh, just a few minutes. Please take your seats. After all, just remind uh, who are not from, who is not from Germany. You know, we are in Germany. We need to be starting at nine sharp. Otherwise, we'll bear no consequences. Good. So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, those that are uh, here physically present. I don't know if anybody will join and we have also people joining online. Uh, welcome to the Supera workshop organized by uh, European Energy Research Alliance, together with its job programs, uh, here joint program energy storage and the photovoltaics. Before we start officially with the presentation, I would like to give the word to our host, which is uh, the Council of Institute of Technology, Alexander Alex Balducci, and she will give some uh, introduction of these three days uh, events and then we will kick off properly so please okay switch up yes so first of all it's a pleasure to welcome you all of you here at kit thanks for taking the effort to come here and to join this event uh, i just want to lose uh, a few words um, first of all uh, the schedule I suppose you, you won't be able to read it. You can also see it outside then. I just wanted to say, okay, we have today in the morning the Spera workshop, today in the afternoon and tomorrow, also the Aerotron program energy uh, storage and uh, PV uh, meetings. Then we will also have the Viper Lab workshop and the storage workshop. And then on Thursday, the workshop on applications for hybrid energy storage. Um, here you can see the agenda of the day. So we'll start now immediately with the Square workshop. And then <clears throat> you saw already coffee break will be at the back of this room. I think a lot of you found it already. Um, and then uh, for your information, the lunch will be served in the first floor. So this is my main message to you now. And then in the afternoon we'll have the um, ERA uh, JP meetings. Um, the ERA JP PV will go afterwards around all the five of the bus to the um, city to see the uh, PV research of uh, KLD. And the, the Irish will stay here and we will go then after the event directly with the bus for dinner. And here just uh, that you see already faces. If you have questions, if you need something, uh, please contact uh, my colleagues, Miriam, Olga, Andrea, or me. Thank you very much and enjoy the event. Well, there's also one another point of thing. There's going to be a common dinner now today at seven. Uh, we'll leave by buses, so please don't leave. Uh, I think you you can leave nonetheless from here without uh, taking the bus. So we go all together. So now I will give a uh, floor to uh, Mr. Walter Trump, scientific spokesman person from Energy Center KIT, for the keynote speech. Thank you very much. Good morning all together. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you here at KIT. And um, I think I do not have any slides. So... No. Can you do it or can I do it? Or... They were already there, just we'll go back. No, don't, 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 oh, oh, no. Otherwise you'll yeah. uh, discontinue yeah, the connection. The connection. Uh, can you just... Uh...
So um, try to convince him that the next time it is over there, yeah? And better to do it in summer and not in winter. <clears throat> but, um, mm -hmm. no. Can I do it while I, uh, no? Work. Doesn't work. Speed, you want to change something? What did you do, Spiridon? Now ah, it doesn't work? No, it's now it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Should we put oh, just unmute you. Uh... Spiridon, now I can hear you. It is OK now. OK. So what have you done now? Now it's good. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> For the minute? For the minute, yeah. <laughs> Okay, but it's not only KIT. KIT is belonging to the Hammers Association. Probably all of you are aware of this. These are 18 research centers in Germany, and they built in around 2000. They have built this association to, yeah, to, to be a bit stronger in the German, European, and worldwide environment. And um, there are six fields of research within these Hammers Association. And KIT is belonging to energy, which is certainly the strongest uh, part, and earth and environment, matter, and um, information. And what I said already, this research field energy within the Helmut Association is um, divided in four programs. Um, to this workshop, I would say the um, ESD workshop, energy system design program, and this um, material and technologies for the energy transition is certainly most important. But we, we look as well, together with our European partners, together with the Helmholtz Association on fusion, uh, ITER development, and as well the Stellarator development in East Germany. And uh, we have as well a program, and I'm coming from this, my, my background is uh, reactor safety research, the program uh, nuclear waste management safety and radiation research, where certainly you know that Germany is phasing out, but nuclear waste management is certainly an important issue. But coming back to the energy centers, we think um, usually um, all the disciplines are faculty oriented. So we have the faculty mechanical engineering, faculty electro engineering, but we think it is very important to, to combine as well these disciplines with the discipline of technical assessment of society involvement. Um, so uh, these energy, uh, these KRT centers are really oriented in this way to, to bring together various disciplines. And especially in the energy sector, you all know coming from nuclear, uh, all the discussions with the society. And we think that it is very important, this kind of outreach um, to talk to the society, to talk to politicians, but to bring as well within KIT, within the Helmholtz Association, all these disciplines um, together. That, uh, yeah, that we can convince the, the society that we are doing the right way. And um, we group this energy uh, center within these um, four topics. And these are the, I would say the classical topics. The supply is one, storage is one, which is here with the stories from ERA, very important uh, topic and use and uh, the distribution. 
But you see as well that we have some gray circles around this here, uh, system integration, where all these uh, disciplines come together, and as well this sustainability um, uh, frame over all this. And sustainability means as well for us reliability. And uh, I, I think this is going close together that the um, sustainability of an energy sector has to be as well resilient and has to be reliable. And you see it's in, at KIT, a pretty huge part is KIT Energy Center, 800 uh, scientists are brought together and uh, a budget um, of over all of 250 million euro. And we have um, 60 institutes here. Briefly to the storage topic. What are we covering within the storage topic? Electrochemical energy, batteries and accumulators. This is within the Celeste, but we are looking as well beyond lithium, for example, to develop these batteries. We would not need finally uh, lithium, or, for example, sodium or uh, others. And uh, we think that for the um, energy storage in the long term, seasonal energy storage, hydrogen, and all the products related to hydrogen, power to X, are uh, uh, certainly uh, pretty important. And I would uh, briefly would like to go briefly as well to this uh, sustainability topic. Uh, we are all talking about a circular economy. We are talking about sector uh, coupling and so on. And this is all in this frame of sustainability, integrated reliability, and um, yeah, kind of emergency uh, management. What do you need if you have a failure in a system, how to bring it back to operation? And uh, all this is integrated in this um, um, sustainability uh, topic. Most important, we are a research university, but we are a university. And therefore I think education and training, the younger generation, I'm more than 60, so we have to look for a younger, younger generation to substitute all the old gray people. Um, and um, this is one of these topics. We have built up a graduate school within this KRT Energy Center. Uh, Jörg Sauer is heading this and the, the support of Heike Kohl. And um, where we try to uh, bring together PhD students from various disciplines. So from the uh, technological assessment, for example, social uh, society disciplines. And uh, they together, we are trying to build up real world projects for them where they can sit together and uh, try to, in a very small scale, very small frame, trying to, to shape the future technologies. We have as well large scale research infrastructure. One of the biggest examples is certainly this um, Sensic Laboratory or Energy Lab, but as well various other. Uh, and, and we are um, within this um, Sensic Laboratory, we are one of the largest uh, European um, research centers in the energy sector. And this is this Energy Lab, you can see it here a little bit a view from top. We have this smart energy system simulation control center, the Sensic laboratory. We have a solar power park, but we built with this as well, um, hydrogen production with electrolyzers. And uh, then we go to power to X. So we have a methanation um, uh, plant and uh, all these processes um, uh, going to um, uh, going to then these kind of e-fuels or refuels, uh, what we will need in future. And we will in future as well couple a geothermal uh, energy plant system because we are sitting here on a kind of a hot spot in the upper Rhine Valley where we can extract from the underground 150 degrees C uh, warm water uh, to heat up these buildings. What you see here, this living lab buildings, uh, they are just to, to test the future of heating, electricity demand and so on uh, all together. And there will be integrated as well this uh, geothermal energy plant. A uh, couple of examples for kind of outreach, let's say we are, we have just in, a two, in two days, we have a kind of a NECOC workshop where we try to, to uh, receive a, anything from negative carbon emissions. So we collect the um, uh, CO2 from, from the air 
uh, and uh, together with, a, uh, with the hydrogen production. And this is the example in Eratec, which we, you will hear in the afternoon, uh, methanization, and then um, via uh, a kind of um, methanization uh, backwards process, um, we, we come to a kind of carbon black, so, which can be used in industry uh, so that we really get rid of the carbon of the atmosphere and this, uh, therefore we call it negative uh, CO2 uh, emission. Another example um, is the PV um, research, let's say, and the, the trick behind it is this uh, kind of tandem photovoltaics um, so that we combine perovskites with classical uh, photovoltaics in a kind of two layers and uh, trying to develop um, record efficiencies of 30% or even more, together with the uh, Hammer Center in Berlin, with Jülich and uh, KRT. And this is uh, within this um, Helmholtz Zeitenwende project, turn of times project, which was launched by the uh, research ministry um, um, after last year's event, the, um, yeah, what, Putin, what Putin did in um, Ukraine. And um, therefore we, we think we have to be pretty fast. Uh, the milestones you see here after three years proof of concept and uh, within five years, we try to transfer to mass uh, production. So we think that can be a huge step forward for implementing um, renewable energies, for implementing uh, photovoltaics. And these are just a few examples of this transfer, technology transfer. Um, we cooperate. I, I think it's not only outreach to the politicians, to the society, but uh, this outreach means as well that we transfer our ideas, our innovation um, to industry, to in Eratech is uh, certainly an excellent example as a startup coming from here, uh, but we, we have we cooperate as well to huge uh, industry partners such as ABB, BASF, Bosch, and we are just setting up a new cooperation with uh, Siemens Energy right now um, to develop electrolyzers, for example, together to develop hydrogen um, infrastructures, for, for example, or uh, liquid hydrogen. I mentioned it already, it is um, several kinds of, of projects within this energy lab, but uh, together with the state of Baden-Württemberg here, close in this region here, uh, we, we develop these refuels projects, fuel for the future, uh, for trucks, for airplanes, but as well might be for house heatings. And um, there are several other uh, projects on the way. And yeah, I mentioned it already with this um, real lab ideas of this ENSO. Um, we, we think that to, to train the young people is as well certainly a very important uh, topic um, within this KLT Energy Center. And I think these are as well some transfer examples. Um, and transfer examples means as well certainly that we have um, um, receiving third party money. KT overall has about uh, 1 billion euro per year and 30% uh, of this coming from third party. So with this brief overview, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very successful workshop. Are there any questions? Would be able to answer. Otherwise? I give the floor to you. Ah, okay. I'm speaking now. There's a question for you. So, if any of you have any questions about the bar. If not. So, thank you. Thank you very much for the Pleasure. So, now we skip. So thank you very much for your introduction. It's really nice to be in this, uh, this so advanced uh, institute. We know very well what Kate is doing. Okay, just a quick uh, agenda here. We are going to roll out this work workshop just in half a day. So we'll have the first part, which is going to be uh, the presentation of the project by my side. I'm uh, Ivan Mateak, uh, Super Coordinator and Operations Director at European Energy Research Alliance. 
and I'm Mary Oxa as a senior scientist, project manager for VTT and project partner with Insupera. We'll then uh, present also uh, the two pathways, which is energy storage and solar photovoltaics. Uh, the first part of the morning will uh, give them the close with the panel discussion on collaboration between research and industry, best practices, barriers, and replicability potential. And after the coffee break, we will have, as you can see, the cross sectoral dialogue for system solutions toward the clean energy transition objectives. And we will end around uh, one. And as you can, as you heard before, the lunch is on the first floor of this building. Let's then uh, start, uh, skip uh, all this presentation, which you saw already. Good. So SUPERA stands for the support to the coordination of national research and innovation programs in areas of European research, Energy Research Alliance. It's a quite uh, a long title, but uh, this is what you know you need to, to do when you have this kind of uh, CCA project. So this is a coordination of super protection. And as a such, uh, we support the set plan and the energy transition. So everything that I'm going to talk about here, mainly actually, is going to be related to the famous set plan, which is, as you know, uh, the normative framework that every technology in each of us are also called to work within and also to work for the execution of implementation plans. Uh, so Supera, we facilitated the coordination of the research community. We are the biggest uh, energy research community in Europe. Uh, we uh, try to accelerate innovation and uptake by industry, and this is why today we are here to talk about, uh, about this very interesting and very urgent topic. The next one is to provide recommendation uh, to policymakers as a research community, also to advise European Commission on what is the position of the research community on the clean energy transition goals and how to reach those, and to promote the set plan and the clean energy transition. Uh, this is uh, the project that will end uh, this June, so fortunately we will not be able to join beautiful uh, Alpine uh, KIT uh, uh, facility, but you know, you can invite us besides Super. we will be very happy to join you for, some, for one reason or another. Uh, so uh, what we like to say in Super that we connect the dots uh, quickly, it's uh, index a beneficiary grant, so which means that uh, ERA, European Energy Research Alliance, is the only beneficiary. But we are very well supported by five, five, uh, five linked parties, which is KIT, uh, thank you for hosting us today, CAA, DTU, Sintep, and VTT. Now, objectives of this specific uh, activity of uh, Supera, it's, uh, it's, well, it's this one. Uh, what we have done, we have analyzed the national energy climate plans and we tried to identify the pathways that can be replicable and which are common to different member states tackling specific technologies. So by analyzing uh, all 27 national energy climate plans, we have identified, and Maria Oxa will tell you more in the detail, which pathways we have identified as the most prominent one that can be as a good example of collaboration between research and industry. And then on, to, on this, we have built uh, some scenarios and some recommendations that will provide, we will provide the commission at the end of the project, as you can see here. This is the project activity uh, or objective. More specific, um, more specific workshop objective is to uh, update what is happening now in energy storage and photovoltaics. We are living in quite a dynamic context. So uh, it will be really interesting to see uh, what guys you have been up to uh, in uh, this recent time. Then uh, we will discuss key findings and analysis of the National Energy Climate Plans, uh, focus on robot cooperation practices and experience, consider some preliminary recommendation, and then uh, this activity is follow up of series of workshops that we have carried out previously. This is actually fifth of the workshop on this, uh, on this talk. Now, uh, a bit of the set plan, I know that you're familiar, but this is, you know, uh, again, this is a granted project and we need to address this aspect. So why the set plan and energy and national energy climate plans as a tool for the collaboration? I would like to start with this, uh, with this slide, which shows the quite uh, uh, dynamic context of the r and in the European energy transition context. Everything started in uh, 2008 with the creation of the set plan and for call for the major and the better collaboration between, uh, between, between LTOs and universities across Europe 
to uh, enhance technologies needed to reach the objectives of the climate neutrality. And then starting from then, we have the set plan that has been updated in 2015. And currently today, it's under revision. Uh, it should have been published in November, but uh, you know, they are taking some time. So the final result we will see uh, this June. And uh, uh, since then, uh, let's say everything that was related to R&I in, uh, uh, in the energy transition process was dictated by series of emergencies. So nothing came out, uh, you know, by uh, by uh, political political, let's say, uh, regular reasons. Everything by uh, facing the emergencies. The first one was a climate emergency. So the European Commission came up. Uh, came up with the European Green Deal immediately after uh, the breakthrough of COVID, so the recovery plans and uh, answer to the COVID. And if this uh, hasn't been sufficient, uh, we had to uh, to address emergency, energy emergency, which was uh, mainly related to the war in Ukraine. So we had repower of EU, and then finally competitiveness emergency. And the Commission just uh, last well in February published the Green Deal industrial plan. And we just need to wonder what will happen next emergency this year or in the best case scenario next time. So this is, a, let's say, the context that the uh, research and innovation needs to be uh, considered again. Now, uh, the set plan evolution, as I said, it was uh, instrumental uh, since its establishment to force the collaboration between uh, set plan countries, industry and research institutes. They did great job so far in coordinating national and agendas, and it has created 14 implementation plans with respective uh, implementation working group, uh, with respective uh, implementation plans, and many of you are part of those. But given all these urgencies that I have uh, just mentioned, uh, we are in the revamping process of, of the plan as such. So first of all, it needs to be uh, aligned and uh, in harmony with the King Green Deal. Uh, with the energy union recovery plans and European research area policy communication. It should strengthen European strategic energy value chain, so to secure energy supply, because so far set plan it's very good you know, to dictate uh, many technology uh, let's say provisions by leaving aside uh, policy issues. Adapt the governance to make it, uh, to, well, uh, to deliver on strategic importance by keeping it flexible, because as you can see, everything is moving so fast, so the set plan as a such, which is a long-term plan, needs to be quite flexible to address all future emergencies. And finally, promote synergies to leverage on existing funding. There are plenty of money all around, we know that, and we are living with this also kind of inflation because of it. We need to be able, actually, European Commission, the United States, to leverage better the national finance. Now, uh, just to repower you, because this is very important, uh, and this is specifically important when it comes, uh, when we talk about collaboration between research and industry. All of you will know this number, so I will not repeat them. What is here important is 600 uh, gigawatts solar power, uh, then electrolyzers, we have uh, save energy, uh, more investments, diversity, energy sources. So I'm telling all this because what we error, what error did at the center level, we have analyzed the Repower EU and we have uh, and the community uh, in collaboration with all joint program came up with the European Repower Manifesto, which provides specific recommendations for the policymakers, but also for our community, what has to be done if we want to achieve quite ambitious uh, goals of, uh, of the Repower communication. So uh, you will be able to take to download it, to take a look. And why all this? All this because you know we have a technology. Yesterday also has been published a report from the United Nations saying that we are doing very bad in uh, reaching 1.5 degrees, or actually staying below. But it says also we have technology to uh, to stay below 1.5 degrees, which is partially true. And you, as a researcher, know better. So we have this decade uh, till 2030, it's decade for the large scale installation of already existing technology. But the technology that we need to reach the goals for 2030, 2050 uh, don't exist, well, or it's at least don't, don't exist, or it's at the inception phase. So we need, uh, we have just two decades to develop, demonstrate, test, implement new technologies and solutions. 
uh, I think that's very going to tell me that I need to, yeah, I will. So look, uh, this again, this is a bit of slides. So need to accelerate existing knowledge implementation. I would like to draw your attention on the right side of this slide, which is uh, closing the uh, well, closing the loop between knowledge generation. The research, it's historically, it's used not to look on the long-term uh, perspective. So 10 and more years, why we need to answer for the current urgency and current needs we need to be, uh, well, to work more on knowledge uh, implementation. So we should, you know, bring closer the greenish circle to the to to the blue one and help the policymakers, but also researcher to implement what is already here, what, what is already there, and to work continuously for implementation of this huge knowledge that we have. But we'll hear more later, later on. Uh, this is the last slide about this, the European Commission's Green Deal Industrial Plan. This is very, very important because uh, research uh, will be uh, an essential part of it. It's based on the four pillar. I will just uh, mention the first one. It's a Net Zero, Zero Industry Act published last week, which mentions the technologies that are present today here, and uh, uh, they will again play a major role. It is also critical raw materials that was published. Everything, all of these three was published last, uh, last week. And they're very important in consideration about collaboration between research and industry. If we want to first stay below 1.5, which maybe we will not, but at least uh, to um, reach the goals of the 2030 and 2050. So this is, will be from my side, water supera and bit to set the scene, as you can see, there are many things uh, in the middle. Now I will leave the floor to Maria Oxa from the UPT, and she will talk more specifically about two pathways that we have analyzed and defined, uh, uh, which is energy storage and PV. Uh, Maria, I don't know, um, uh, the slides are, uh, her slides are where? Actually, should be here. But I see that the next one, it's already panel discussion slide, which is, uh, okay. I will go back to that one. Uh, it's there, it's there. Is this one, correct? Good. So yes. if you want, I will uh, just tell me, I will then uh, change the slides. Okay, thank you. So good morning, everyone. I am Maria Oksan. Thank you, Ivan, for this presentation of Supera project. It's pity I can't be with you in Karlsruhe. But first, so I'm going to, as, as Ivana presented, uh, to uh, present you these two pathways, energy storage and solar photo photovoltaics, which we have been analyzing and developing with the Supera team. And in the next, present, uh, next slide, so uh, Ivan already introduced the background. So the context when we started the project in 2020 was already that there was a critical need for energy transition, and now it is more. But at that time, we took the national climate plans as basis of our, of our uh, analysis. And the target was, in a way, to find the gaps and the enabling factors and also uh, best practices, how research and industry can support the energy tra transition together. And in the next slide, just shortly. So the National Energy and Climate Plans were already drafted and uh, released in 2019-2020 from each EU country. And they were supposed to include national targets, objectives, policies and measures for different dimensions and address an array of technologies to meet the EU's energy and climate targets for 2030. And here are the list of the dimensions. And the national energy and climate plans are uh, presently, currently being updated. And the original target for the second release of those NSEPs pieces are, is next summer. So you have also the possibility to influence on your your governments when they are drafting these national energy and climate plans to also include the relevance of research and innovation. And in the next slide, so what we did was that we uh, analyzed all the NSCPs pieces from the 27 uh, countries and also the European Commission assessments 
And from the analysis, we looked for regional coverage, re regions with best practices, competitive areas in Europe, and also the technologies which needed cross-sectoral and systemic act activities, and also the maturity of these measures and activities. And ben based on those analyses, we selected six, actually they were then uh, techno technological pathways. And they are wind energy, hydrogen, energy storage, bioenergy, energy systems, integration, and solar power. And we have been now, as Ivan said already, this is the fifth workshop. So the target is that we discuss and hear the industry and also research point of views, how to best collaborate, what kind of best activities and practices there are, and also if there are gaps that needs to be uh, pointed out. And based on that work and this dialogue, we are presently working on transnational collaboration model, and we will also, as Ivan told, uh, draft the recommendations on different levels. So how this research industry collaboration could be improved. And in the next slide. Yeah, wait just a second. I'm trying to move to the next slide, but. Uh... OK, so I will now shortly go in over what we found based on the uh, NSEPCs, in National Energy and Climate Plans, both on energy storage and also solar slash uh, PV. And from here, I would uh, shortly say maybe that, uh, especially on energy storage, what was found out, here are some uh, left on, on the left side, like in a way, what, what is the background, and on the right side, also what was in the NSEPs. And what was mainly uh, remarkable in the, when we analyzed those NSEPs, were that uh, market driven de development of storage was already indicated, especially in the Nordic areas like Denmark, Finland and Sweden, and also in the Net Netherlands. But uh, it seemed that even hydrogen was very strongly planned in some of the NSEPs like Netherlands, uh, Portugal, France and uh, Germany. There was a clear uh, link missing from hydrogen and energy storage. And I think it will be shown in the ne next uh, version of the NSCP is definitely there. And then in the next slide. So here are some examples of the best practices that we found on energy storage from the NSCPs. So there are regional cooperation in research and funding like France and Germany. Uh, they have this bilateral funding for energy storage and also there is Nordic energy research include uh, which has also energy storage and the funding already there and these activities are already ongoing and what also was uh, identified that there are some regulation best practices like in Finland and also we looked what kind of clear indications there was already for storage like Austria, Bulgaria, Italy and Spain already told that there is already planned capacity expressed. And also what we saw that especially remote areas like Greece, where C, where for, or 4C that uh, energy storage was very important for them. And as already said in the uh, presentation in the morning, so circular economy is definitely important. And also based on uh, this circular economy, example was found in Portugal, where they are trying to recycle and reuse their two last coal-fired power plants as energy storage. And then uh, on the NSCP's key highlights, so there was a clear predict of visible growth for solar energy production in the next 10 years. And most countries considered food developments both at small scale and also large scale. And for the next slide, there is already, I go quite fast, so we'll keep the agenda. So we all also saw that in a way there were clear indications on uh, practical targets like in buildings and also uh, 
consumer slash prosumer uh, status was very important in a way to, to really implement this activity. Thank you, Ivan, just go ahead. And also, what, was, what were the factors that will lead to the expansion of solar energy is, of course, the funding mechanisms. Enable, enable regulatory, as, as was said, like it has to be steady and uh, predictable, and also simplifi simplifications in the permitting processes. And this is already seen, of course, in these acts that EU has just launched. And also the collaboration between different uh, projects and also uh, translateral uh, between different countries is very important. And also, of course, there are international initiatives in this area, like Clean Energy Ministerial Arena and International Solar Alliance. And on the PV, ah, oh, oh yeah, it, yeah, that actually, yeah, we, I didn't have the final slide, but uh, what we are now actually doing, yeah, Which just one? go ahead. So what we are actually now doing in the Supera project, so we are now collecting this uh, dialogue and also this analysis to so-called cooperation uh, model and cooperation interface. So we target to show what kind of cooperation there is in EU level, in national level and region level, regional level, and what kind of best practices there are already ongoing. And the target is that uh, to bring this transitional awareness to support the transition energy transition in EU level. And we have been drafting these collaboration interfaces, so-called collaboration triangles for all these six pathways. Unfortunately, they are not yet ready. They are finalized uh, probably this week. So I don't have yet clear uh, figures to show you, but in the next slides, I will have the two presentations on, on both for batteries, so we selected from the NST storage batteries as this energy storage uh, technology area, it's so complex. So we, we analyze the batteries and even on only on batteries, the European level has very complex ecosystem, which comprises from stakeholders in research organizations, in industry and the government also. And there are on EU level, there are, of course, implementation working group on batteries and batteries Europe, the batteries. And then there are also some as partnership associations like BEPA and then a collaboration network, Battery 2030 Plus, and also industry led European Battery Alliance EBA. So, in a way, these are all very um, strong actors. And also, we have been trying to figure out how these collab collaborate and what kind of, in a way, ways there are also to enhance the research and industry uh, activities. And then uh, Germany, as very lead, leading uh, country on batteries, was selected. And uh, the collaboration triangle in, in Germany, we saw that it comprises from national government, industries, both large and small size, non-profit foundations, and of course, research organizations. And there was one regional level example here. So the Ministry of Economics has established a collaboration program in Baden-Württemberg with around 7.2 million euros to develop battery research activities. So this kind of research industry collaboration is very strong already. In, in Germany. And this is a good example that could be spread also to other countries. And then for the uh, solar photovoltaic, the collaboration was found that it is also, there is already activities between government, industry and research uh, through European initiatives. And the main actors are Zeppelin Implementation Working Group on Photovoltaics, ETIP PV, and then also Project PV Impact, the European Solar Photovoltaic Industry Alliance, and of course, ERA Joint Program Solar PV. And uh, as Italy is quite a uh, pro runner in, in, national, uh, in, in PV, so in national level, we analyzed Italy. And there is also collaboration realized through several collaboration schemes between the government, industry, and research organizations. So it is already active there. And this was a good example from 
this tri working triangle. So there are two ministries and then uh, Italian National Research Council and also Energy System Research Organization. And regional level example uh, includes uh, in Enel and the Emilia Romagna Regional Administration uh, have assigned an MOU to support the sustainable energy transition, and it has already realized with development of large scale solar PV plants. So this is the end of my uh, presentation, and I'm very eager to hear the presentations uh, today and also the discussion in a way, what could we take on as Supera project for the recommendations? So where you see that should be uh, put more emphasis on this, this research, and, and research and industry collaboration and what are the best practices already? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Maria. So, uh, should just uh, delineate what we have been doing by analyzing NSFs. Many things have changed since then. So uh, now we'll see what, in practice what is happening actually in collaboration between research and industry. And uh, now the panel discussion will follow. I would like to call uh, on the stage here uh, Francesco Matteucci, program manager from European Innovation Council. Uh, Ivan Gordon, uh, John, co coordinator of the John Prong Photovoltaics from uh, uh, Imoima Make Energy Wheel from Belgium. So you can also join the. Well, I would like all, all of you to join here and then you will take stage presenting your things. Uh, then Miriam Gilles Badahi, uh, uh, John, coordinator of the John Program Energy Storage. Tim Burtken uh, from uh, founder manager director from Inaratec from Germany. So please join the end with the stage and finally. Simon Phillips, co-coordinator of the Joint Program for Photovoltaics and the head of an area strategy in the Health Institute for Solar Energy Systems. So almost all the era partners besides the Inaratec. So how this is going to roll out? We will have first Francesco with, with his presentation. So this is what you need to use. And uh, you have Spirit over there who will keep time and uh, you know how it works. Yeah? Make signs that you need to wrap up and things like this. So thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I will try in the next 20 minutes to show an example on how European Commission is trying to, to give the money for the development of the deep technology. So we'll speak about some opportunities. Just as a first question, who knows about the EIC in the, can raise his hands? Who knows already something about the European Innovation Council? Okay, not, not so many. Okay, so just to, to start the why there is the European Innovation Council. Okay, we start from, uh, from deep tech. Deep tech is uh, the definition that is quite trendy in the last period, but uh, there is not a clear scientific definition. Normally what we consider inside the European Commission, deep tech uh, entails with something that is more hardware related, so the software is embedded normally. Obviously, it is a multidisciplinary approach. And what we want to fund with the deep tech is the high risk technologies, obviously with, uh, with a lot of uh, money needed normally. And everything has to be done inside an open innovation approach. And the deep tech funding opportunities, there are many. They normally ranges in between the public and the private sector. And what is really the problem of deep tech, it, it, needs a patient capital. It means that normally, I don't know if you are familiar with the big world of private investors, such as the venture capitalists, normally the cycle of venture capitalists is in between three to eight years. And normally deep tech takes much more. If we start looking at when good enough developed the first lithium ion batteries and then Sony put them on the market, it, it was in between 20 years to, to bring it to the market. And so the issue raised there from the previous president of European Commission, but also and then from the commissioner of R&D, to launch an initiative to help and provide support uh, towards the development of deep, deep tech in Europe. And so I don't know if you are familiar with this, uh, let me say, terrible word is called the European paradox. That means if you give the same amount of money to a European researcher, it will bring you wonderful science. But if you give him the money to make the exploitation of the science, to make money out of the science, European 
scientists and European, let me say, ecosystem is not the most efficient one. And so based on this, uh, let me say, uh, ambition to overcome the European paradox, it was funded the EIC. Here you can see the, the, the horizon Europe and the EIC is over there on the third pillar. And what we do, we, we fund uh, three main three funding schemes called the Pathfinder, Transition and Accelerator, what is all the innovation journey of the, <clears throat> of the deep tech. So we start uh, from very early stage research this is in the Pathfinder, but where is the difference when you look, for example, at our housing? So here on the right, on the left side, you see the ERC, okay? Where is the difference between the ERC and the EIC when you have to apply for a Pathfinder? The tricky part is not so difficult to explain. ERC has got a goal that is to develop science, to increase the knowledge around the physical, chemical, biological, social mechanisms that are behind the science. In EIC, we want to look since day one, since the early stage of, also the early stage of research, really to look at the final exploitation. I don't want to say obviously that when you start developing a material, you already have to know will be the final customer, but what is, in the last 40 years of studies inside the innovation management, what has been shown is that it, since day one, you start speaking with the final users, you start looking at the market, and so you start to move from the typical push approach, where I do something in a lab, but I have to push it because I don't know what I will use it. And you go toward more a pull approach, that means I look at the market needs, I want to solve problems. That's the way in which innovation increases its success rate. So what we do, we fund three funding schemes. The first two, Pathfinder and Transition, are open to partnership, are 100% grants. And the third one is Accelerator. We will listen in a few minutes in Eratech that is one of our beneficiaries. And this is open only to SMEs. And the three main novelties of EIC is the first one is that you can see there are all the calls are open, so bottom-up approach, that means no topic prescription. The requirement is the deep technologies behind this, but there are also challenges. In a few seconds, I will explain this top-down approach. The other way around, we provide not only public, sorry, not only grant, but also equity. EIC has set up the first ever European Commission Venture Capitalist Fund. The peculiarity of the equity from the European Commission is that it is a patient crowding in capital. It means that when we give the equity, we want the company to get the same leverage of private money as well as we are giving, because we are never the first investors or the main investors. We want to crowd in to de-risk the investment from private. Why? Why? Because the main reason is that the venture capitalists and the private risk investors in Europe are much less developed than in other continents such as North America or, or for example, countries such as Israel. And so the third one, what is? We work what we say. We are not a grant giving agency. That means EIC is the only European Commission agency entitled to do policy and implementation. That means every year we work, we write our war program and what we get once we analyze the projects, we evaluate the projects, as I said, we are not grant giving. That means we do not only monitor the projects, but we work with the projects. We provide them many services that are called business acceleration services from external sources managed by the colleagues of European Innovation Council. But there is another peculiarity that are the program managers. We are 10 people dedicated to certain areas. And what we do, we identify the challenges. As I said before in this slide, I told that each of the funding scheme has got an open and a challenge approach. So we identify challenges and we do this kind of identification of the challenges, looking and speaking with all the ecosystem of science and innovation worldwide. So we interview continuously scientists, we speak with investors, entrepreneurs, corporates, and we try to identify where it has got sense to push the money of the EIC around the challenges. And the second thing that we do, we work with the projects content-wise. What does it mean? It means that we do not take care of the project management side, of the administrative side, of the financial side. We look at the contents. We try to help our beneficiaries in working together in a cooperative or in a competitive approach. We try to push them in the direction of the final users. We try to help them in what is normally called the innovation journey. Why? The reason is that we work with a lot of projects. We have got the, we are lucky enough to see a lot of things going in the right way and in the wrong way. And we try to exchange ideas to look 
what is the biggest ambition for a deep tech company that should be the ambidexterial approach. That means to look at the short term, that means I want to make money, I want to sell my products, and to look at the long term. I need science to improve my technology and eventually to steer my activities in a long term project. But to do this, as I said, you need to work in an open environment. So we work on the content, starting from the identification of the challenges and then going on with the different activities. For example, in the big area of clean technologies, we have three program managers. We categorized almost 85 projects ongoing in the field of low TRL, so the pathfinder and transition. And there are, there are ongoing more than 150 projects developed by SMEs, what I showed before the accelerator projects. And what we do, for example, inside the challenges, here at the formatting of the slide it didn't work well, but just to tell you that each year you will see in our work program, there are challenges dedicated to clean technology. So all the topics that has been discussed today, ranging from solar, for example, to energy storage, the, in the 2021, consider that EIC was funded in April 2021. So as I normally say, we are a startup with a 1.5 billion euro to be spent each year. And in 2021, the first, Pathfinder challenge was on green hydrogen production technologies. So the breakthrough technologies ranging from biological production, so biomass electrolysis, looking at the photoelectrochemical production and all the kind of production technologies in the field of hydrogen. Then last year, we had in 2022, the Pathfinder challenges one, one was on CO2 and nitrogen management and valorization. Next week will be published the results of the valuation. And the other one, one Pathfinder challenge was on mid long term system integrated energy storage technologies. So what we do in all our challenges, we try to put some eligibility criteria and in the field of the raw materials, for example, which we ask the eligibility criteria of, of not using critical raw materials or fully recycling them. We ask obviously to look since day one at the life cycle circular approach or to look at the design thinking in terms of adding the possibility to develop products in the future that will enable Europe to work with its own, let me say, materials in a way, but also technologies and value slash supply chain. What we try to do when we work with the projects is really trying to explore the potential collaboration, to look at the other side of science inside more the innovation. We try to set up once again collaboration. We try to contribute to the development also of new policies. We all know that many renewable energy technologies are policy enabled. So it's crucial for us to speak with the other ministries that as you know, in European Commission are called DGs. So speaking, for example, with DG Ener or DG Klima to speak with them, hey guys, this is something that we need to change in terms of policy. Because if we do not change the policy, it will never take place. And then we start this kind of discussion, obviously data driven, getting and using the expertise of our beneficiaries. So for example, in terms of photovoltaics, we all know that nowadays there is a lot of discussion as Ivan showed before, for example, inside the energy, sorry, inside the industry net zero act. And we see a lot of push inside the EU solar alliance to push back to Europe, the Silicon value chain. I, am, I have to admit, I'm quite skeptic if we look at the big numbers of the long value chain of silicon, we all know that when we look at polysilicon and ingot, China and Asia in general is nowadays processing more than 99% of the, of the materials of polysilicon and ingot for the mono and polycrystalline silicon. So what we need to do, the ambition is to bring back a part of this value chain inside Europe. But there are other opportunities, for example, of developing. There are new technologies that are the possibility to recycle. Daily, we receive requests from big corporates asking us if we have got companies working in the recycling of PV. We have got some, but let me say not enough. When we look, for example, at the future generation, we saw before from KIT, there are many studies, not all in KIT, many other research centers, and also corporates are working on the tandem solar cells. So for the big PV plants, we have to consider that the eligibility criteria to put this technology in the market are the durability. When you want to do, you have got the certification procedure. So this is something where we are trying to push the companies as well as the research centers in the tandem, for example, to look at the durability. But there are other big opportunities for the PV. It's, we all know it's since almost 30 years that there are strong work, first in the dye-sensitized solar cells, then in the perovskite, in the organic photovoltaics, 
looking, for example, in the future at how to power from low power lightning indoor, for example, the IoT devices, or to look at the real VIPV, so the semi-transparent photovoltaic windows, for example. There are many opportunities. And let me say there are also many funds coming from Horizon Europe projects. This is an example of a big portfolio. These are all the ongoing projects inside the big area of solar energy conversion funded by EIC. You can see that we divided them in solar thermal, in part, let me say it's solar to electrical and solar to fuel. We have got recently a new program manager fully dedicated to e-fuels and also to solar fuels. And here we are working. Obviously, there are also here in the, in the yellow part, you see these are companies, project of companies, SMEs, trying to work in the scaling up of new technologies in the PV. And so there are many possibilities of collaboration in the challenges of the solar PV. We can see the possibility, for example, of the BIPV when we speak about of the future market. We can look at the new technologies. We are funding into Silicon One company, real ambitious SME that is trying to set up the Silicon value chain, not via Chokrowski, but via Epitaxial and many more, let me say, uh, assessment of the potentialities of the different technologies. When we go into energy storage, also here we know there are, there are different technologies we saw before the lithium and the beyond lithium. We focused last year, as I said before, in the Pathfinder, so low TRL energy system integrated of the mid long term energy storage. And we are hoping that these projects will, in 10, 15 years, develop the most important thing for the future of the stationary that are reliable, durable, low cost energy storage for the mid long term energy application, for example. We all know that there is there will be a huge increase in batteries request in particular coming from the EV. But how can we set up this? Let me say a good story. The good story is, as has been shown by the colleague before, European Commission in the last 10 years has been able to develop what I like to call, as I said before, an ambidextarial approach in the battery. That means it has been, and it is funding, the long-term research but also the short term, we are all aware of the North Vault installation of the first gigafactory in Europe. And this has been funded by the collaboration between European Commission, North Vault and European Investment Bank. Three billion euros has been given as a loan to loan the company that then obviously has been able to fundraise private investment. And this is an example in the terms of batteries where Europe is trying to push. But don't forget that we need science. We need innovation to look beyond lithium. We cannot rely only, <clears throat> it's more and more evident that it's not an energy transition, but it is a materials transition. We, look to new, we need to look at new chemistries. We need to have the use, for example, in material science of more developed computational material science tools that will enable a faster going inside the new chemistries. And so, for example, not only new chemistries, but also, as I said before, for the PV, the same way for the recycling technology. Recently, in December, European Commission put in place the first law on the second life of batteries, and new work in terms of policy are being pushed in the direction of having new possibility to recycle, to enable, once again, through policy, this kind of technologies. And here we see also in the energy storage, we have got low TRL projects, but also companies working in the development of new deep technology for the energy storage. And also here, we have got so many opportunities. I don't like to say of problems. I always think that if we see a problem as an opportunity, then we will launch new initiatives. That's what is normally asked to the entrepreneurs to look at the good side of the things. And in energy storage, for sure, there are so, and there will be always more and more opportunities. But as I said before, if we look at the energy materials of the future, we need to look also at the side of the potential new mining, new, for example, technology, when we look, for example, at the possibility to get out from water, the combination, as we saw before, what is working in the island sites of combining the solar PV value chain with the desalination. And where is the problem nowadays? Desalination is expensive, sure. But another big problem are the brines coming out of the desalination. And we need technologies to extract, let me say, in a sustainable way. So good from the social, economic, and environmental way and actions from the brines, the raw materials. And there is a lot to be pushed in this direction. So to conclude, I think that 
The need of big technologies, both in the field of solar PV and energy storage, is evident. To make it happen, we have to look also at the market application. We have, as Super Era is showing, to have the collaboration between the member states to look where there are the best practices. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. There are so many good things going on. For example, in the stationary application, as well as the IoT device powering, there is a space to develop new technologies, to integrate new systems, and to really make Europe, let me say, the good opportunity for the future in terms of renewable energy technology. Thank you very much. Now we'll have uh, Tina Bolton uh, from the co-coordinator again for photovoltaics and from my uh, Belgium. Uh, I apologize to the speakers, I didn't know if actually we had other screens, so uh, let's uh, not actually need to pay attention. This is a mistake. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ivan. So indeed, I will uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the joint program on photovoltaic solar energy from ERA, the European Energy Research Alliance. And um, well, as the name suggests, we are focused on the direct conversion of light into electricity. Uh, this joint program was founded uh, as part of ERA around 2010. And of course, what we try to do since then is to help accelerate the development and deployment of photovoltaic technologies in Europe to of course reach the European climate goals and to become a, a climate neutral society by 2050. And um, currently there are two uh, coordinators, co-coordinators you could say from uh, this joint program. So there's my colleague Simon Phillips who's also part of this panel and there is myself. We have uh, currently 34 members. So their um, logos are, are shown here. So our members are both universities and also research institutes uh, spread around Europe, mostly Western and Southern Europe. And of course, all these universities and institutes are really key players in the field of photovoltaics. Um, I want to uh, highlight one of the things that we did last year in 2022. So in collaboration with uh, ETPV, the European Technology and Innovation Platform for Photovoltaics, we created the so-called uh, European Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda for PV. And uh, this document was published around May 2022. And in this document, basically, we describe what we believe is needed um, in Europe in terms of R&D for PV in the next 10 years, let's say until 2030, to really be able to reach the European climate goals when it comes to photovoltaics. And this is one example of a nice collaboration between research and industry, because um, yeah, the JPPV represents the research partners in Europe. The technology platform ETPV is more representing the, the industry in Europe. And so this document is now also used as um, yeah, the basis to actually update implementation plan for PV, which is part of the, the set plan. And of course, yeah, the idea here in this document um, well, there were some, some fundamentals in the documents. First of all, uh, what needs to be done in terms of R&D to really make um, PV the, the key uh, block for the um, energy transition in Europe, which it needs to be. But also we looked uh, in this document, how can we get the whole uh, strategic uh, value chain back to, to Europe? And so I will not go in detail in uh, the content of this document, but I want to highlight um, on the left-hand side, the five main chapters which we called five challenges uh, that we have in that document that we identified. So together between industry and research. So first of all, we need to further um, enhance the performance of the devices and, and reduce the costs. So that is sort of yeah, business as usual, you could say. That is what we have been doing uh, during the last uh, 10 years also, but we have to go further there. But then there are uh, several other challenges that are really also very important. So the second challenge uh, is um, to further increase lifetime reliability and especially sustainability. So we will have to produce a massive amount of PV modules in the future <laughs> worldwide. So uh, we have to do that in the most sustainable way. And we need a lot of R&D to actually make PV production much more sustainable than it is today. The third challenge is then 
there are lots of new applications appearing, so-called integrated photovoltaics. So instead of just having a PV system on a roof or in a large field, we see now PV systems that are seamlessly integrated in the environment, for instance, in buildings, in cars, floating on water um, in combination with agriculture. And that, of course, also poses a lot of challenges. Then uh, the integration in the smart energy system of the future. So the massive PV deployment also has a lot of consequences for the, the, the grid, for instance. And then a fifth challenge, a non-technological challenge, but also extremely important is actually all dealing with all the socioeconomic aspects of massive PV deployment, which is not to be underestimated. So these are the five, let's say, main uh, chapters, challenges in this document. And we have also recently then modified our um, joint program management structure to reflect this, this, these five challenges. So you see here, uh, we have now eight uh, sub-programs. Um, the, the faces you see are the, the faces of the current uh, sub-program leaders. So the first challenge, which is more about technology development, is split into four uh, sub-programs, which are all dealing with a specific technology. So we have silicon, perovskite in film, and tandem uh, PV technologies. And then we have four more uh, sub-programs which correspond to these uh, last four challenges in the, in the uh, strategic research and innovation agenda. So the sustainability, the integrated PV, the system integration and the socioeconomic aspects. And finally, I want to say a few words about the interaction between ERA PV and industry. So as, as, as I look to, to, let's say the European scene, there are some uh, players uh, there that are interacting continuously with each other. So we have on the one hand ERA PV that is representing the research. And then you have a few organizations that are uh, representing the, the industry. So we have the ETIP, the European Technology and Innovation Platform that I already mentioned. We also have Solar Power Europe. It's basically the organization that represents uh, yeah, the, all the industry across the whole value chain in Europe. And you also have ESMC, the European Solar Manufacturing Council. It's an organization that since several years has been very active in trying to get the whole PV manufacturing to come back to, to Europe. And so with these four, um, there is continuous interaction. And I want to highlight two um, things that came out recently. So on the one hand, you have the Solar PV Industry Alliance that was already mentioned. And then also the idea of having an uh, IPSE on PV. So first of all, the European uh, Solar PV Industry Alliance that is uh, basically quite recently created. And it's one of the concrete initiatives announced in the Repower EU as part of the EU solar energy strategy that was published last year. And the main goal of this alliance is really to accelerate solar PV deployment by having, uh, again, across the whole value chain, PV manufacturing in Europe. And it's quite ambitious because we are aiming at having 30 gigawatt of annual solar PV production already from um, end of 2025. So it's only a couple of years from now. Whereas at the moment we have almost no um, um, really European PV manufacturing. And so this alliance brings together the industrial actors, also the research institutes, politicians and, and all kinds of stakeholders. And it's driven by EEC and the AIT you know, Energy. Um, and for instance, the Battery Alliance is one of the uh, yeah, examples from the past that, that um, is used. And also recently, I think last week, when the Net Zero Industry Act was presented uh, by the EC, then also this alliance was really highlighted as a main contributor for photovoltaics. And so this uh, alliance is very active at the moment. So we are looking uh, in different work groups on, for instance, how can all this be funded and how do the European laws perhaps have to be changed to really uh, allow this. But also, for instance, um, where, do we, where will we get all the, the skilled people that we need uh, for this? So there is also this skill gap. Um, so there's a lot of work also for academics um, in, in this um, yeah, system. And then something else that has been running already for several years, um, mainly driven by the European Solar Manufacturing Council, was the idea to also have so-called important uh, project of common European interest on PV and IPSE on PV. So this is, of course, a long and difficult process. We started this in 2021, but now with this uh, extra drive um, to get really uh, this 30 gigawatt uh, production uh, back in Europe by 2025, this again uh, is picked up as perhaps one of the elements that, that can solve the, the, the funding. So in summary, I would say for PV, the time is really right at this moment to rebuild complete PV manufacturing value chain in Europe. This is not going to be an easy task. 
Um, so both industry and research should work closely together. And the main idea is, of course, that we still have a European technological leadership in, in photovoltaics that we should actually use to, to really uh, give a uh, difference and edge to our uh, industry. If we do not get the industry back in Europe, then also we will lose this um, PV technological leadership. And then also R&D will become yeah, less important, I think, in this field in Europe. And so in general, I would say ARPV is well positioned and connected to the industry to really help uh, the development and deployment of PV uh, in Europe. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, now we'll have also uh, the program on energy storage and the uh, recording. So thank you very much. So my name is Miriam Gilbarraji from KIT, and I am the coordinator of the ERA Joint Program on Energy Storage, together with Stefano Passerini, who is the deputy coordinator. So, but just let me start giving you a short introduction into this joint program. So as uh, Ivan mentioned before, uh, this joint program on energy storage is one out of 18 joint programs within the European Energy Research Alliance. You can see here the num figures and numbers. The program was established in 2011. It is composed of more uh, of 40 uh, research organizations and universities across Europe, coming from uh, 15 different countries. We cover the five different energy storage areas. So our vision is to accelerate the European energy storage research to achieve a renewable-based carbon-neutral Europe by 2050. What is our mission? So I'm sorry for the format here is very, it's very small. Our mission is to develop common research to and coordinate the scientific community in the field of energy storage. Second, to establish a dialogue at a European level among all the stakeholders and involved in the research and development. Third, is to facilitate knowledge transfer by communication with the industry and stakeholders or is to advise policymakers, of course. And uh, the final one is to establish best, pra best practices by developing new technologies and pave the way to the market introductions. And today we will mainly focus in the collaboration with industry. But let me show you the structure of this joint program. So as you can see here, the uh, program is very much technological oriented. We have five uh, sub programs dedicated to the different uh, technology areas according to the storage principle. So, from electrochemical, overchemical, thermal, mechanical, up to superconducting magnetic energy storage. And on top of that, we have a sub program dedicated to the techno economic and sustainability aspects of energy storage. So you can see here some examples of the technologies that we have in our joint program. For example, lithium ion batteries, post lithium ion redox flops, supercapacitors, power to X, hydrogen, reactive metals. We have thermal storage with latent heat storage, thermochemical storage, sensible heat storage, pumped hydro, flywheels, compressor, liquid air, high temperature uh, materials, as well as SMIS systems. So these are the phases beyond these sub-programs. So in each sub-program, we have a coordinator and a deputy coordinator. You can see for SP1, Margarita and Sigmund, who are here today, Peter and Linda for SP2, Salvatore and Daniel for SP3, Atle and Giovanna, SP4, Antonio and Joffre, SP5, and Yolanda and Manuel, SP6. Most of them are here because today we will have our uh, biannual steering committee meeting. So if you want to know more about this sub program, you can just go directly and talk to them. But let me show you the main activities of this young program. So we have different activities. Some of them dedicated to young researchers, some of them dedicated to industry or to advise policymakers. As I have mentioned before, for example, we have a mobility scheme that allows us to exchange scientific uh, uh, stuff, let's say, uh, between the members in a very easy way and to make use of the different uh, research infrastructures. We organize policy and stakeholder workshops very often. 
We have online PhD days to stimulate exchange and discussion on the topic of uh, energy storage with young scientists. We granted awards to support activities also in the field of energy storage. And so let's say many other uh, activities that you can see here, but I won't go in very much into detail. Let me now just show you the collaboration with the industry. So as I have mentioned before, we used to organize many workshops, as for example, the workshop on applications for hybrid energy storage that will take place next Thursday. And we used to do so in different ways, either policy industry oriented or technology oriented. You can have a look and visit our webpage and there you will find a very, uh, very large amount of reports and discussion that we have made in the past 12 years. Another collaboration is uh, that we have a very uh, strong collaboration with this is this the European Association for Storage of Energy was established also in 2011 and represent approximately 60 members, including utilities, technology suppliers, distribution system operators and tr transmission systems operators. We brought already two technology uh, roadmaps together. The last one was in 2017. You can see here the delivery to the commission and there we brought six different recommendations for research and development policies and regulatory uh, framework, for instance, that energy storage should be considered as an own assessed in the energy system in order to avoid double uh, taxation, which is one of the main barriers for the deployment on energy storage technologies. And if you want, you can have a look there in the link and you will find it. Also last year, we decided to establish an industry advisory board for our joint program in order to get in touch with the industry and in order to discuss the progress of the joint program so that we can have a strategic advice from the industry side in order to know also the needs from the industry. And finally, I just want to show you an example of a joint effort. This is the storage project this is a very large project. It's called Storage Research Infrastructure Ecosystem. And the main objectives of this project is to foster a European ecosystem of both industry and research organization on hybrid energy storage technologies. The second objective is to provide access to the infrastructures. And as you can see here, we aim at establishing a very large ecosystem. And therefore, we have a very strong connection here with industry, within this external layer with more than 100 stakeholders, most of them coming from industry, but also other stakeholders. We will know more about this project later on today and in the coming days, therefore I won't go into very much into data. I just wanted to show you another uh, proposal, which is called Rise Energy. In this case, it's also a research infrastructure project, but not only for energy storage technologies, but for all renewable energy technologies. And in this case, it's also a research infrastructure project, and we are at establishing an ecosystem in the field connecting all uh, renewable um, technologies from PV, concentrated solar power, hydrogen, energy storage, um, ocean energy, wind energy, all of them are included in this effort. And if you want to know more details, we can let you know the proposal was submitted some days ago. We need to wait now until the evaluation results and see if the project will be granted. Last but not least, so thank you very much for your attention and also thank you very much to all KIT coordination team behind all of these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Now we go to the story, success story from uh, from Inertec. We will hear more from Bill Bolton, who is a founder and energy director. Uh, it's uh, if I'm not wrong, correct me, it's a team of uh, KT. So correct. we will hear how actually this book creates the research and uh, and uh, more uh, probably tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Tim Bertgen. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Aneratech. 
Anaratech stands for Innovative Chemical Reactor Technology, but I'm actually showing you what, what we are doing today. So the problem, I think everyone is aware, we need to be climate neutral. Um, there are excellent ways already um, how to decarbonize uh, several sectors. Uh, electromobility is one, one, one uh, instance. But however, uh, to be climate neutral, we also have to tackle uh, other challenges, which is how do we get aviation, shipping, um, heavy duty transportation, also the chemical industry um, carbon neutral. So this is why we are not talking about decarbonization, but we are talking about defossilization because what we do, is actually I have it in the bottle, uh, it's liquefied electricity. So we convert electricity together with CO2 in synthetic fuels, the process called power to X or e fuels, synthetic fuels, whatever you name it. Uh, you can later have a smell on it. Uh, this is actually liquid kerosene, which we uh, produced uh, together with KIT in a research project. So this is actually also how we, we solved it. So I put the very initial slide um, we, we made uh, when we were founded in 2016. So already a couple of years back, uh, we had this basic idea and said, hey, why not let's use green electricity uh, to produce green hydrogen and then use the green hydrogen and some greenhouse gas to convert it into renewable fuels and, and chemicals. We had um, um, excellent uh, basic research at KIT. So more than 15 years, KIT was researching on uh, very innovative microstructured reactors. And they were actually at the, at the front to, okay, let's, let's industrialize it. And so we actually took this idea, we made the slide out of it. And what, what grew out of it was actually the power to liquid, the power to X industry um, being today also um, very prominently in the news. Um, here in Germany, we have a very German discussion about uh, the internal combustion engine, um, but, but we need to think broader. Uh, tackling climate change is more a global issue. It's not a German issue if we make internal combustion engines or not, but we need to see how much fossil crude oil we are currently burning for other purposes, for all kinds of industrial purposes, and we really need to defossilize them. So this is where we started and said, okay, let's produce the synthetic hydrocarbons really from electricity, from green hydrogen and CO2 and produce a wide variety of uh, end products with it. So where are we now? Well, that's a bit uh, spelled uh, probably from, from the copy paste. So where are we currently now? Nine years uh, already after. So we have passed the demonstration phase. Um, we did that in very strong collaboration with our R&D partners. Uh, once we need to mention is VTT from Finland. Uh, VTT was actually our very first customer uh, buying the first uh, plants um, uh, directly after our um, incorporation. And of course, we have very strong ties with KIT um, in different projects. We heard it to, uh, this morning in the welcome speech. We are part of the Energy Lab 2.0, where we provided one of our um, containers we are uh, one of the core parties of the so-called NECOC project, where we have one of our SNG plants standing. And this helped us actually with all the funding we also received uh, from, from national grants and also from Horizon 2020 grants to go into the industrial scale-up phase. So this is where we are currently. We have built containers already in the megawatt scale. So we are scaling up our technology. And we have now two plants uh, in the commissioning phase. The one is uh, together with uh, the aviation industry, where we produce clean kerosene, as shown here. And the other one is with a, a German refinery in order to help them to substitute the fossil crude feedstock with renewable feedstock to produce chemicals for paints, coatings, for tires, for the electricity sector, so for all kinds of products where we need today fossil crude oil. The next step is um, that we are going into the industrial rollout. We are currently already manufacturing our industrial scale plant, which will be located in at the industrial site of Frankfurt Höchst. We are very proud that uh, we have here also some support from, um, from the SME accelerator with a project called empower to x where we did the basic engineering, the detail engineering and the scale up of our technology. And now, of course, um, we need additional funding to um, bring the technology out in the market. So we are VC backed. Uh, we have um, strategic investors from the field of aviation, uh, from the field of shipping, 
And we also have clean tech VCs um, from the field of yeah, deep tech and, and climate tech. But uh, this is actually not enough to really tackle the climate change. And we also need the support from the European Union and the, and, and the EIC to really grow faster because what we don't have is actually time to wait. And that's then also um, the next step uh, by 2025, we want to have reached the industrial maturity really with giga scale, world scale plants, which are not located in Germany or in Europe, but they will be located at the so-called power to X sweet spots of the world, which are in uh, the North of Africa, which are in Chile, Australia, um, also uh, East Asia is, is, is very interesting for that. So um, we are not only doing R&D, uh, we are actually a, a company that also needs to earn money. We have two business models. The one is the plant sale business model. So we build and then sell our technology to customers. But we now, with all the experience we, we achieve, we also have the e-product sale business model, which means we build, own, and operate our own plants. We invest in the plants. We have now invested over 40 million euros already in our own technology and bring uh, the technology um, to life and make these e-products, these e-fuels available for everyone. So some, some, some mood pictures uh, for how we evolved. So as mentioned, we started very early with a collaboration with VTT um, in 2016. We built the very first power to liquid pilot plant in the world, in Finland. Uh, the, the capacity was half a barrel per day, so not much, but it was the biggest power to X plant uh, in the world. And here, together with the Finnish partners, we demonstrated that we can actually store renewable energy from the summertime into the wintertime by this chemical ener energy storage. The plants got bigger. Uh, I mentioned KIT. So we delivered here um, um, a, a fish trap, so a, a PTX container uh, to the Energy Lab 2.0 with the focus to convert green electricity, direct air captured CO2 into synthetic kerosene. That's an ongoing project, also in combination with other nat national level, uh, national uh, R&D projects, um, actually really great success. And now we are here at the market rollup for aviation and the chemical industry. You can still see it's still very compact. Uh, we can put it in a container. We can put it in modules. That's a very, very big chance for us to manufacture these modules in-house, not only in Germany, but also in Europe, but then export it uh, all over the world and deploy it wherever it is needed. So we should talk about the copy paste next time, uh, how this is working. But uh, nevertheless, the, the message is, is, is the same. Now our next step is a production facility with approximately three and a half million liters. We are going to invest up to 40 million euros. Uh, we have already leased the site at the industrial site in Frankfurt Höchst. Some may, may ask why, why Frankfurt Höchst, why Germany? Is, is uh, Germany like one of the countries with very cheap electricity prices where it makes sense? No, it's obviously not. But we have here the unique chance that we have access to green hydrogen, which is currently just incinerated. And we have access to biological green CO2, which is currently just vented into the air. So we can combine actually these two waste streams at an industrial site, we can prove our next generation module and it's quite close to an international airport so we can fly in all the potential customers from Australia, from US, from Chile to show them that the technology is here, that the technology works and that we just need to scale it up at the, at the best sites of the world to really produce the fuel at scale, at low cost, ideally with uh, price parity with fossil fuel by 2030. That's our ambition. Um, if you're interested, um, please feel to contact me. Uh, my contact details are here. We have won several awards uh, also from the European Union where we are very proud of. Just recently the year two award, um, which actually shows um, that what we are doing has a meaning, has a purpose, and this is actually driving us every day. Thank you. So thank you very much for compliments. We will now have also a little bit of discussion after the last presentation, so uh, we will tell you more about it. Now the last presentation from Sam Phillips, head of the Strategy Company Institute for Solar Energy Systems, and as we also have co-coordinator of the Joint Program for Thank you, Ivan. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit on uh, research and industry cooperation, not only from Fraunhofer, but more on the ingredients um, that are needed to have successful cooperation. And I'm going to start with this curve. In every workshop that PV is, someone has to show that curve. So I'm going to show it this time. Um, that's the PV price experience curve. Uh, the PV people will know that. Um, it's a double log logarithmic chart where the module price development is shown on the X, X, X uh, shown here. And here's the cumulated production on double logarithmic scale. And in the theory and also in practice, you end up with a, a line here. And that shows the strong reduction that um, PV module prices have uh, achieved from 1980, shown here to 2020. And if we look, we will start in 1997 uh, for this talk. And there, the uh, module production was on very low levels. I mean, you had 110, um, 110 megawatts uh, per year and a price of six euro per watt peak. So it was quite high. And um, I'd like to outline one piece of development that um, maybe led or that also supported that price reduction that was uh, the development of the PERC uh, solar cell. So what happened at ESA, at Fraunhofer ISE in 1997? I mean, our main profession is scientific excellence, but what we started there already is to think about, okay, if we want to have uh, scientific excellence and want to transfer it later on to products, we need some kind of infrastructure for technology scaling because we don't want to stop at scientific excellence, but we want to transfer our developments into, um, into products. And that was at that time um, quite ambitious and quite visionary because the PV um, companies were quite small and it was quite difficult to get funding from the government for this infrastructure because they had to claim first to the research, then we will think about scaling. But we wanted to start the scaling quite early and were successful, um, luckily. And then two more ingredients that we started, there were techno-economic analysis. So from early on, we tried to calculate the costs that the development had and which also integrated which costs um, and which strategies were um, the most promising on cost level. And then obviously we started quite early with industry um, partnerships and with discussions with industry. So starting with scientific excellence, I mean, this is um, here you can see not only the improvement of graphic design from here to here, but in 1979 already, uh, this solar cell concept was this, which was called passive added emitter and rear solar cell. The idea was there, it was a sketch at that time and uh, in that time from 1997 uh, to 2022, there were many scientific steps taken uh, and needed to bring that um, technology to a, um, a reasonable level. Um, there are many developments now on this timeline and I got a remark already when I sent up the slides that I have to take um, attention for the timing. So I won't go into detail on that. There's a nice uh, paper on that uh, from my colleague Ralf Breu where all this outlined if you want to go to more detail. But what we see here is that there are many different steps that needed to be taken. I mean, the first step, for example, here was that the uh, context at the end, um, the technology needed to be, to be developed to have laser dope selected emitter, emitters at the uh, backside of the solar cell that was carried out by Enel. Um, and then there are many different steps here. And what uh, my main message is here that all this was done in collaboration. So it's not a Fraunhofer development only. I mean, we are involved in some of the steps, but it's really co collaboration of many, many actors. And that's also what I see is quite important that research works strongly together in order to improve the products in the end. So I'm just going to scroll through this. I mean, this is the main easy development here on the line. IMEC did some major steps, Eindhoven, um, ISE again, ISFH. So many, many actors were um, involved here. And in the end, um, we have a Berg solar cell, which is now standard in PV production and also is one of the ingredients that helped to bring down the cost for PV modules. There are many more scientific steps that needed to be taken, the module development, production and so on. But this is really one thing um, that, um, it's very important. And what we also tried in from an early 
stage on is to take the TIL levels into account. I mean, you will know the TIL levels, but we try to basically develop a TR TRL strategy quite early. So we did not only concentrate on the lab scale, but we also thought about, okay, if, we, if the lab scale is successful, how do we get the pilot line and how do we get there early? Probably so that the pilot line is ready when we move up the TRL levels. Um, and that is also quite important now that we see that in tandem development, for example, that it's already now the discussions are ongoing. Okay, if this and this development is successful, where do we have the pilots lined? Can we already produce the pilot, pilot line so that they are ready when um, the product comes out of the lab sta stage? And that is quite um, important. What is also quite important to take into account if, if you develop this TRL scheme is that the costs increase. And I mean, this is good to read here, but here you see that the cost, is, I mean, it's a rough estimate, but the costs that need to be invested to move from one TRL step to the others are much, um, are strongly increasing. So it's important to um, take that into account also early who will, who is able to invest the money and from where does the money come at which tier level so in the beginning you can do it with low amount of money but especially now looking at industrialization and so on you need very um, high amounts of money and you need also other players involved okay. so that's again um, tls schemes are quite um, important and also for efficient resource resource use and you know we strongly encourage to um, think about this line early and also um, yeah, on the funds that are needed for that. So this is just one um, picture of uh, our pilot production line that was um, yeah, ready in 2006, where we have um, industry scale tools where companies can come and can um, test their tools and we can optimize the um, production on pilot line level, which is quite important. And after that, it's transferred into, um, into uh, labs and into companies. Yeah. So this is just one, it's not only PERC that we did there, but um, also other technologies. And here you can see the continuous increase of efficiency that we have in this pilot um, production line, which is quite important to move up that line that's um, yeah, what all solar cell researchers are trying to do. We have also uh, touched that topic. I mean, we do techno-economical techno analysis. Currently, uh, there's a strong request also for um, economic cost calculations on FEP level. So we have a group of about yeah, 10 people who are only doing calculations for possible FEPs. Um, that's currently strongly, there's a strong demand for that that also originates from this group. And then, um, yeah, that's one, uh, the last slides. I mean, we have strong collaborations with industry in different phases. So it's also quite important to talk with industry in early TIL stages um, to direct research in, a, in the right direction. So if it's from all, on all TIL levels, it's quite important from our knowledge. And industry is usually quite interested to talk to research on the new, visions that we have. They will be interested to invest money in a later TIL phase usually, but discussions can already be started at lower TIL levels and that's quite useful. Yeah. And obviously transfer cooperation is the key in that. Yeah, so that's my conclusion. I mean, we are researchers, so we want to have scientific excellence, exchange and creativity. Um, infrastructure is important already early to think about which infrastructure will we need when, when our product or our development is successful and to prepare early to be ready for the next uh, scale up. Techno-economic analysis is a good um, and important ingredient and obviously industry partnerships. So. Okay, good. So thank you very much to all the panelists. We had uh, what is the development of uh, tools of the technologies, the collaboration between them, the success story. Uh, one of them now uh, we have for half an hour for half an hour uh, panel discussion. Uh, we will first take uh, the questions from the audience. So I encourage you to. Uh,
to ask the panelists. So we have over there the management rights. Maybe use the so please uh, let them introduce yourself before and uh thank you for the interesting talks. My question is about um about giving parts of the TV industry to Europe. Um so in order to be competitive, there will be efforts to try uh innovative technologies uh which will but which will come with the risks. So with, for example, multi multi junction TV. Or epinexus silicon. So my question is, uh, compared to the pre-2011 era, what will be different this time with investments from uh, yeah, government and industries? So this is a question to uh, to uh, to PB. Francesco. Or oh, okay, PB. so so maybe let's say we well, have institutional part and then uh, more research. Thank you for the question. I'm not the commissioner. So no. <laughs> what I say to the commissioner is, is it's my idea. What, what I am seeing, as the colleague said before, now there is an emerging push in this direction of solar alliance. So the idea of the commission, in a way, is to replicate what, in my opinion, worked well for the battery. In my opinion, it will not be able to work in the same way because the value chain of solar TV in silicon is completely different from the battery one. But for sure, I mean, the idea now that the, I think also the, the discussion on this IPCI, so the interesting project for common European interest that allows each member state to give the money to companies that want to use the national money to set up manufacturing facilities, this will be, I don't know if it is already under discussion, but will be discussed. As far as I know, but I may be wrong, the biggest investment has been recently done in Sicily with the with L, that uh, in order to scale up the production of, uh, of the technology over there, I think they will double the production, right? They should go to six gigawatts from three gigawatts, if I'm not mistaken. And so that's uh, that's one, let me say, of the, of the push on the policy side. For sure, what will have to happen is to put in place, in a way, new kind of technologies to, to come back to the idea. I'm not an expert on Epitaxel. I, I, I made some meetings with this company. I don't know if, if they are trying to scale it up. The problem, as far as I understood, is the applicability and the quality assurance that the Epitaxel growth of the silicon is replicable. So there is some money. On this side, as it happened for Inanatech, the same way the European Innovation Council is trying to push the crowding in of private investors. So it approximately, if you look at the EIC impact record, it, it shows that every time that the equity has been given to a company by European Innovation uh, Venture Capital Fund, 2.8 euros has been pushed from the private sector. So this is called the leverage, and this is a quite good result. But for sure, to finish my long answer, I think that what is needed is more, let me say, private capital and more risky capital. What we see from the position where I am, I see that there is a lot of interest coming from the corporates. It is increasing the number also of corporate venture capitalists, but it is not enough. If we compare it once again to the US environment or to the Israeli environment, the companies are pushing more private money in that let me say high risk initiative as we have seen with the What is missing, I showed before in the slide, is really unfortunately what, what the colleagues of Inerotech are in the face, that is when the European Commission can no more give money because you reach a certain time, let me say, scale up, but you are not scaled up. And so the money from the initial scale up is the exponential growth. This is where worldwide it has to come the private money. And where the European Commission is trying to do is to push this collaboration. A few weeks ago, our director signed an agreement, an MOU with the biggest, the 12th biggest private venture capitalist in Europe between them and us. We are trying to discuss it, but we had also meeting last week. What I see, for example, is also the difference when they speak about early stage investment and real early stage. For a scientist, an early stage is one thing, for the policymaker is another thing, for an investor is once again another thing. And also in terms of taxonomy, in my opinion, it is necessary to push this direction. Thank you, Marion.
Yes, uh, so if I understood your question well, you asked also about um, yeah, how can we make a difference and how we will differentiate to be competitive with, with others. So I would say that well, there are many elements. So yeah, you mentioned multi-junction, okay, it has high risk. That is actually a technology for the future. So I think what we have to do now, especially if we want to have 30 gigawatt by 2025, it has to be with current technologies. And then we should not just compete on cost. We, we are actually beyond the point that competing on cost is the most important. We should actually look for other differentiators. And this is, for instance, what's also being done in this uh, European Industry Solar Alliance. You look like, okay, what, 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 if we need modules with a low CO2 footprint, for instance, we need sustainability. So we have to also have mechanisms in place that we actually are not just buying and installing the cheapest modules, but actually the most sustainable modules. And there we can actually make also a big difference. It's already known that modules which are made in Europe, they typically have a much lower CO2 footprint than uh, the ones that are coming from China. So that's a very big differentiator that we have to take to. And then in the future, of course, we have to go to, uh, to, to new uh, uh, technologies, let's say, to keep the technological leadership. But that also, I think the sustainability part will be extremely important. So we should make not only technological choices because of technology reasons, but actually also for sustainability reasons, for instance, material usage and so on. And then, for instance, uh, when we talk about the low CO2 footprint, these epitaxial wafers that were mentioned are a very crucial element which can lower uh, this CO2 footprint enormously. But it has to be, of course, still proven that you can produce these wafers at the massive scale that we, we need them. So we have to look at actually the technological edges that give us, especially um, in sustainability, uh, the right value. So it's not just about cost, competing on cost, but it's competing on sustainability because that's what we need if we want to be climate neutral in 2050. On this idea that we all know that, for example, in modern politics, that the initial energy is crucial. So we have to have, uh, if we wanted to replace policy recovery, you need to have a very early stage low cost of energy. My ignorant question to you is do you think that what you were saying, so that the lowest CO2 carbon footprint of the TV can be used to make uh, incentives against or within this session at the member states. That means, uh, can a member, I, I don't know, you know, can a member, can Germany say from tomorrow, if the, this has to be the threshold of the CO2 for a certain TV, if you buy like this, no, no fee. If it has got a higher CO2, you have to pay it. This is possible from the legal point of view as you study in super area or this is not possible in terms, of, I mean, of, of independence of each member state. I for sure know that the European Commission, in terms of energy, has a limited freedom of because the responsibility is in charge of the member states. I'm also not sure about all the legal things there, but I know, for instance, already in the past in France, we had tenders where this was a, let's say, an element. I don't know how much independent. Um, you know, how far uh, member states can go. I'm uh, not a legal expert in that, but you have a valid point. Let's say, for instance, at the moment, uh, you have um, yeah, the, the most uh, energy intensive steps in the silicon uh, production are among others and wafers. And so, typically, there you want to use low cost electricity, but also green energy. So, typically, you see that in Norway, they have a lot of these uh, plants, also France claims because of the nuclear, then it's uh, low CO2 and so on. So at the moment, yeah, if you want to take things back to Europe, you, have, you cannot just put the factories everywhere because of this reason. So, but of course, we hope that the whole of Europe is becoming more green uh, very soon. And then you again have also a level playing field in Europe, because now actually you have to say, yeah, does it make sense to have a, a wave of production in Poland? Probably not, but then it's as bad as in, in China. But so, so there is some internal competition now also if you want to uh, adhere to these strict sustainability rules, which hopefully is also an incentive for all countries to quickly you know, go to this energy transition. From ICT. Uh, we had in Germany a very thriving uh, solar industry, which was crippled by a 
a very short uh, term plan uh, um, cutting of funding. So uh, has there been a lesson learned from this? How we get a say more sustainable business model or those? Uh, tough question, but in the times at that time were different because the prices were quite high. So um, the production moved there where you can have the lowest prices, and that was China in the end. And it was difficult for German companies to compete with that. As Ivan already said, and I already showed in the slides, um, the times are now a bit different because prices are very low already. And I mean, Probably know the company Meyer Burger that is producing in, um, in Germany, and they have higher prices than uh, Chinese modules, but they are still easily able to sell their product because maybe Germany is a plane that people, uh, uh, with at least residential buyers, are uh, willing to pay more. And if you add sustainability to that, um, I think that people will be willing to pay higher prices. That Chance for scale up. Um, so there are different um, buying arguments now for people. So that's so the scene changed a little bit. Um, still, we need, we will need high volume and um, we will need someone that's where it all comes down to invest the money. This will be high amount of money, and you already said the commission will not invest in money, so we need private investors to do that. And, as my burger does now, they scale up and they try to um, bring their currently higher price modules into the market by additional selling arguments, and that works quite well. So, my hope is that the scene changed, and also that local manufacturing and uh, G independence and so on are now arguments that are clearly taken into account. That that makes a difference for the company. So. Only competition on prices will not be the same. And that was different in the um, 2000 years and so on. Would you like to add something to that? So I fully agree. And I think also there needs to be now a realization in Europe that they will want to become independent of gas coming from abroad. So that we should not become dependent on alternatives like the methanol, the windmills coming from abroad. I think that realization is there, but it also means that you have to be more protective about your own um, industry and R&D. And I remember very well, I mean, it was very nice to see on the slides of um, Simon about the work with uh, many uh, different institutes, uh, even many other people doing work uh, development uh, for the last 10, 15 years. And this became a very nice product, and then it started being produced in China. I uh, was in 2016 at a conference, the CEO of in Malaysia, where they had a lot of CEOs and CEOs of companies. And one of them actually literally said, We would like to thank all the Europeans for solving all the problems and developing this technology. And now we can produce it. That was the reality. We should not have that again. So you see, we are very smart in developing. But then, as was mentioned already, when it comes to uh, having the return of, of the investment in terms of economic uh, stuff. We are very bad, so we should. So then we should also, as Europe, do something about that to to, to stop repeating this this error again. We have other questions from public from the audience there. Hello, Frank from Party uh, Infrared Innovation Technics, and I also have a question regarding the IPCI TV because uh, in terms of all the uh, Crisis management in Brussels. We they also set up this um, what is it called again? A temporary crisis and transition framework that allows uh, states to subsidize the uh, energy renewable energy companies. Will that sort of kill the IPCI PV because it's a quicker and less complicated road to uh, subsidize PV manufacturers? Thanks for the tough question. I mean, I'm quite ignorant about IPCI. I can tell you what I know about battery. The battery, it was a, once again, not it was, it is, it is going on in the I, I, I 
spoke a little bit with the EIB guys, giving the money, finding the political ways and the policy way to get the money to Oxford. And it was really, a, I mean, I also learned a new word that maybe you all know that is financial engineering. I mean, he explained me how it worked. And frankly speaking, it's not so different from a very basic science that because, I mean, they really have to create everything. Because to give 3 billion euro is not something explaining that it's not so easy. And so for the PD, I don't know how it will work. From what I have seen, the IPCI uh, in the battery is the, the policy and the political willingness to involve uh, the national value chains. And this should enable also, once again, the private investor. What I have seen, I mean, I, I let me say, weekly speak with worldwide VCs because this is part of my job. And what I always learn from them is that money for them is never a problem. Money is a problem for the scientists, for the people, for the normal people, but for the financial guys, the money is never a problem. They need to do this. What is the big advantage of VC as European Innovation Council is the real capability to show that we do this. For example, we invested in, in, in Eratec, and then in Eratec made a little step. So this is an enabling factor. But to answer your question, I really don't know what I see that the political willingness is really to involve also, involve also the member states. Because, for example, the, in Italy we call it PNRR, in, uh, in Europe it's RRF. This huge amount of money needs also to, to be pushed in a long term direction. I would love to say that the IPC high for PD would be one. In Italy, a little, I don't think that the RRF money went to the NL scaling up, but this is a result of European Commission, but this is something that happened. I don't know if Maria Berger is looking at this opportunity, but for sure there is once again the strong connection between the national member politicians and the European one. And this discussion, it is, let me say, advancing in the good way in the energy transition. I see daily, just to give you, and then I shut up, just to give an example, I saw the Margarita Vestager, so that I think she's the, the vice president. She attended for four hours a meeting with all the big European VC clean tech. And I think that to stay there four hours, a big, big boss of all of us, it means that she leaves. Otherwise, I've seen other politicians sitting down, signing bye bye, and going away. So she stayed there four hours. I hope to understand better which are the needs. And I think that the biggest thing is the private investors, they want to, the European Commission of the member states to de risk the private initial investment. Then they can keep them. Uh, so maybe before taking this uh, on this question, let us think it's about money now. I know that you said that the commission spent a lot anymore to keep the vendor uh, to give money anymore to fuel company. So the question is with this new net zero industrial act, which is react reaction to quite concrete action from the United States. So let hope to be as at least at least as good as the, the, the American one, if not even worse, because we are capital right. Well, many companies are moving to America because they can get they can get money immediately tomorrow. So we are also reading in newspapers, also battery uh, manufacturers and all the others are moving from today tomorrow. They move to Austin, to you know, to also to Canada because Canada is eligible for the for the uh, reduction inflation act. So what do we do if you have this opportunity? What will be would you think to to move the production in the United States having a complete freedom, you know, have fresh money in two days or fight and stay here and uh, rely on the German, German government, maybe easier on the European Commission, maybe difficult, but you know, it's uh, also ideological question. So what do we do? And maybe I need to choose my words wisely. No, no. <laughs> no, no, it's a, I, no, it's a, I no, as as it's a, no, it's a really, I'm curious to I mean, hear what it's, 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 it's a huge uh, chance, uh, it's, uh, but it's also an opportunity here. So, um, Anarotech is one of the pioneers in the power tech field. Uh, we have always been at the forefront realizing the very first initial projects, and for quite a long time, we were alone on the floor where um, all the big oil majors, also other technology companies were just like looking and saying, ah, we don't want to have the first mover disadvantage. You just go ahead and then we jump in. Uh, what we have seen in the past years is that um, the public grew more and more bigger. I mean, now all the studies are out there. Just today in the Tagesschau, in the, in the, in the German uh, first television, uh, is a huge article where they say there are not enough e-fuels by 2035. We need to stay up more. And faster. 
And what we've seen in the last years is that more and more competition grew, and we like that because so you are not the only player on the floor. But since October last year, all the other projects were shut down. It, it, it's also in, in discussion with the German governments where they said, no, it actually doesn't make sense here, we need to go to the US. So of course, we are also looking at it. We just uh, onboarded a new uh, investor, uh, which is Honda, which is very strong in the Silicon Valley. So uh, of course, we have US plans. But um, we are uh, not only a German uh, company, we are actually a European company. Uh, we have uh, strategic investors from France. So actually, all the money besides uh, the Honda money came from Europe. So we have a strong identity, identity here. And it's actually a big chance because so many projects were announced. We need also an e fuel production here to just be more resilient from the economy. And that's actually a big chance because all the projects being announced now, industry partners are shutting down the projects, moving to the US. It's also an opportunity for us. And uh, maybe we don't have the best uh, production prices for the fuels, but it's the same situation with the PD. So, of course, you will have at the end you have some national quarters. Uh, you will have slight quarters where you say, okay, if we produce um, the fuel um, uh, in the country and we are not like transporting it from Chile to, to Europe, maybe we have some benefits. And that's actually what we are eyeing on. And so all the money we have raised so far, we are investing in Europe. And I think it will still be the case for the next years to come. Okay, thank you for this balanced answer. So let's take uh, <coughs> the question from audience and then we need to wrap up, I think, uh, no? Yes, we are done. Hi, uh, this is Sergio from Vinamanka. Um, so, Vinam is, uh, is a member of the LPD in the last 10 years, and also Perk is an associate partner uh, in Horizon Europe and also benefit from you know, EIC and Corporate and Benedict. My question is this uh, although, from the RD or research perspective, Perk is an, uh, a good partner with many Horizon Europe calls and so on and so forth, what I realized is that the um, Industry is not a part of uh, in Europe from uh, like the public EU or innovation fund and so on and so forth. And when I consider this quadruple phase that we need to involve the society and industry and research uh, together uh, and the government, so do you think that this is a missing part that the uh, associate countries industry is not really involved in uh, global associations? <laughs> Well, maybe I can I can also answer. You know, you have also different different politics, so you don't have to you know you have to respect you know, also also the the provisions of the single market and the state aids. So this is but what your case it's uh, similar to Norwegian way. So they are much you know okay let's call them richer, but nothing prevents them to invest trillions of what they have in other other industries. So for this reason, it's uh, we need to be careful not to disrupt completely the European single market you now with uh, quite rich uh, associate uh, countries. And maybe less rich associated countries. You know? So the, this might be also the well, why this is a, we need to be a bit careful on what is uh, what's happening. You know? yeah, just <coughs> one one note uh, that the Kayo PV is right now they have one gigawatt production line in Ankara and they will expand it to second gigawatt uh, next year. Um, so it's just really coming strong actually, but I think it needs to be more involved uh, in many aspects. Uh, because they also rely on the Chinese products right now. And, but the uh, Vietnam itself is uh, more associated with the European uh, lead, uh, the center of uh, excellence. So I see some sort of unbalance there. Uh, Francesco, do you have any wise? Uh... I think that, uh, as you said, there is a political fence behind that. I don't think it can be sold only from the R&D or from the economic point of view. I think that um, from what we read in the newspaper, there are so different uh, high level things that at a certain level, uh, I don't think that it will be sold on economic level. First, it has to be sold from the political level. For sure, the openness of the science can facilitate this one, but in the end, it will be a, a political decision. I mean, frankly speaking, also if we look at it was said before about the IRA. I am not so, let me say, frankly optimistic that all these 500 billion uh, US dollars will work, as you said, even now we go and you get the money. I don't believe so. I don't want to be the one devastating everything, but please remember that 
Obama government gave 500 million euros to Solindra, a TV company that bankrupted in three years. I mean, you can put the money, but to make the business is another fight. And so I think that you know, we, we work in a good way. Maybe we are not so aggressive as US, but as Tim was saying, we are not our own market. We are nowadays, I think, one of the biggest know-how drivers in terms of innovation in the renewables field or in the green field. So I'm not so worried about IRA. I mean, frankly speaking, last year we went to the, to the US government to speak as EIC, and this year two companies also opened a European headquarters. So it's not impossible that it happen also the first one. Nevertheless, there is the IRA. So I, I would not be so scared, frankly. No, no, I'm not just scared. I was just asking if for no for, for, for bureaucratic reasons somebody rather move to the United States than Europe. Sure. And I believe quite well. I'm also agree with you. You're doing a good job. And also we are presenting the European Union from our side here. So it's nothing that, no. that I'm criticizing. But look, we have just a little uh, time for one question and then we can uh, discuss later. It's from Miriam. So uh, you also present we are part of the storage project, which is a hybrid uh, hybrid storage. And the batteries have been mentioned many times here now from the alliance, from the, uh, the battery alliance, and uh, we have partnership and so on. How the habit storage and the core battery industry is a crowded environment. So, you know, there are many things happening here. So, how do you choose your battles? As, uh, how do you can position yourself with, uh, within quite defined uh, but crowded environment, which is concentrated almost exclusively on, on batteries. So, and uh, in this collaboration with industry. So is there a chance to draw them closer to the habit storage as uh, rather than the batteries, which is now the ultimate topic in Europe? Well, I will try to be uh, very fast, but you are right, there is this Epicom batteries, which is very good. We have a strong collaboration also with uh, our members, members of our, our game program are in the Epic batteries. But energy storage is much more than only batteries. You know, we have a lot of technologies. As I have mentioned before, we saw the example power to X or power to fuels. We have other technologies that need to uh, address other applications. For example, uh, long duration energy storage is very important. Power to fuels, power to metals. And there, I think we need to look for uh, another uh, solutions and also to strengthen the collaboration with investors, with industry, and push forward these other technologies as well, not only batteries, because depending on the application, we need different technologies. And they're available for this kind of industries, available for this kind of cooperation, although they are quite consumed by, by batteries, because they are. So what is, what is the feedback that you have with the collaboration with industry and hybrid storage that you just mentioned? Well, it's very different from one uh, technology to another, you know. For in the case of batteries, there is this very strong collaboration, but in other energy storage technologies, their level is very low, therefore it's uh, very far away until we will get it. It's also an uh, so you see me to hybridize your approach. And also on the, on the topic of the way it's fit to the industry, you see that this symbiosis is working well, with a strong interest for the way it's fit to in terms of it. Yes, yes, we have also a program dedicated to thermal energy storage. You have here also the expert, Daniel Lada, is the deputy coordinator of this uh, um, sub program. If you want to know more about that, of course. Uh, okay, good. Uh, do we have any just the last, very last question, or we will? We have, I cannot. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, that may seem most common to them uh, concerning uh, uh, the relevance of what is happening. If you could just introduce it, please. A part of our mayor, a position of the mayor, the question concerning uh, um, the e kerosene. I would like to know uh, about the cost. Uh, it is quite clear that if we remove uh, CO2, uh, it is something we really want to make a significant on the cost. Uh, but I would like to know the cost, uh, at least now, that's in perspective. Well, I mean, uh, good question. I mean, it's very simple to ask and very difficult. Um, as mentioned, issues are liquefied electricity. So the main cost driver, so 80% of the fuel production cost is the electricity price. It's, it's not the capex. 
it's uh, it's it's not even the total OPEX, it's actually the electricity prices. And um, the second cost driver is the CO2 availability and the CO2 price. Um, if you go to countries where you have one dollar cent per kilowatt hour, you can theoretically today produce for less than one euro per liter production costs, not price. Um, if you go to a country like Germany, um, you can easily go up to seven to ten euros per liter. And this is also like the, the prices you see sometimes in the newspapers, um, like uh, people that fight against the fuels. Um, I mean, that's that's on the other side. Um, we have in the uh, industrial side of this, we, we have um, the feedstock secure to be able to produce for less than two euros per liter. But the good thing now is it's, it's still a billion market. So everyone is craving for the fuels so can, can sell it at the initial rate for much higher prices. So that's the, that's the balancing curve behind it. Our, our goal is actually to be really competitive with the fossil fuels in the time between 2030 and 2035. Fossil fuels in aviation, it is uh, probably for the aviation, aviation probably would be a solution because I don't think uh, that we will have uh, in a very short time uh, a new yeah. brain or uh, yeah exactly but th that's that's the core of the of the recent discussion so there are two two sides so the one side says if you you just need it for aviation and for maritime applications and not for internal combustion engines but if you see which customers are paying today the green premium it's not the aviation and not the maritime sector so it's actually the guys from the internal combustion engine that try to help to make the internal combustion engine carbon neutral. And now we have the discussion about forbidding one technology where you can actually bring several fuel fractions today for quite the green premium in the market. The result is, of course, you can use everything in maritime and aviation, but the costs for these sectors are just higher because they are not paying to the so they are paying paying away like. 60 70 cents per liter for fossil kerosene, and now they have to cope with a higher premium. But that's something which needs to be solved. We will get I do apologize, not the refund, as we found for the production. Thanks. Okay, sorry, I have to well, yes, interrupt this interesting discussion because we have a, a coffee break now. So, thank you, Francesco, thank you, Tim, thank you, Miriam, thank you, Ivan, thank you, Simon, for this interesting discussion. I hope also the public enjoyed. We have a coffee break. And we will meet at uh, half past 11. Uh, let's make it also 35. Eh? Thank you very much. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Spiridon Pantelis. Uh, I'm project manager of the European Earth Research Alliance and colleague of uh, Ivan Tech. So, on this uh, discussion, like final discussion session, we will discuss uh, about. Uh, uh, Cross-cutting topics, um, we call them here systemic and cross-sectorial issues pertaining to the clean energy transition. Does anybody have an idea what, what uh, this session could be about? Please raise your hand. Just a vague idea? So it's only me? <laughs> So what could be the cross-cutting, uh, cross-sectorial issues on uh, clean energy uh, transition? Could be maybe something beyond uh, the technological dimension, but I will explain everything in my presentation, don't worry, it's, it's, it's such a simple um, uh, concept. Okay, let's um, start. So a uh, bit of uh, background. What are uh, these uh, cross-sectorial uh, topics? So the, the main idea is that we'd like to uh, make a template or, or uh, identification categorization of uh, cross-cutting issues. And um, in order to uh, provide more coordinated inputs to um, uh, policy makers. Um, <clears throat> So we did uh, an initial mapping of existing uh, cross-cutting uh, topics and uh, relevant activities based on the set plan uh, implementation plans. So uh, as I mentioned here below, um, the goal is to help to improve a conceptual framework 
for planning technological solutions for the clean energy transition. So um, these uh, topics, let's say, uh, help us to uh, frame um, better the, the, the concept of the clean energy transition. Uh, what, why it is uh, needed? As I mentioned, provide a context for the clean energy transition and sure that the uh, transition has a system perspective and does not look purely on uh, the technological developments and yeah, has a system thinking approach and enable uh, socio-technical uh, transformations. And uh, to be in line with the European and global agendas, for example, the European Green Deal, <clears throat> the SDGs, and um, as many uh, underline, uh, it's impossible to achieve um, with uh, the energy transition without having a system uh, thinking approach and uh, with purely technocentric uh, one. So it's not only about uh, technology development per se, but also how you put it in the context of the socio-technical transformations. Here is the methodology on how we identified some of these areas. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we did a desk analysis on the um, implementation plans and national energy and climate plans, and we identified different overlaps and complementarities between them. Then uh, we made a list of uh, categories and cate uh, subcategories and for uh, classifying in a more um, yeah, that is uh, uh, cross cutting is categorized in a different way. And we also uh, took information from um, yeah, the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, uh, other key documents like uh, our white paper on clean energy transition, and so on. And uh, finally, we cross checked all this information at the end with our joint programs. Just as a reminder, ERA has 18 joint programs and two of them are today here. The, uh, the <clears throat> energy storage one and uh, solar photovoltaics. So um, these are uh, the two, I have two lists here. The ones are technological cross-cutting issues. So it's energy efficiency, uh, energy system integration, high temperature and advanced materials, energy storage, digitalization, security and safety, but also non-technological ones like circular economy, education and training, policy regulation, funding programs and measures, and um, yeah, social awareness, acceptance, engagement, standardization, international cooperation. Uh, just to underline here that um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it, um, it serves as a template to uh, identify and um, these, uh, um, or to facilitate the dialogue on some specific topics that are not purely uh, technical. And um, yeah, this is a preliminary exercise that can be uh, further elaborated. And um, uh, this will be used for developing energy and uh, yeah, climate climate transition plans. So um, if you yeah, would like to have more, uh, have a look on uh, the report, I have uh, put it here in a link. Yeah. And that was uh, mainly my presentation. I think you have a better idea now on what cross-casting topics uh, are about. And actually it's um, on the previous panel discussion, I, I heard that, um, international cooperation between um, uh, that stretch be beyond uh, uh, Europe, but also other topics like sustainability and circularity are key uh, parameters for um, advancing uh, our, the European industry. This is um, a discussion on these uh, uh, cross, uh, cross cutting topics. So um, in this panel discussion, I will have with me four people in, in presence and one online. So um, I would like to invite to come here um, Ruben Hunig 
from uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of uh, Fitonics. Okay, can come. Uh, Sagar uh, Venu. He's a software engineer in Fenecon. Katarina Wusto uh, will join us online. Uh, are you here, Katarina? Can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, great. Can you also hear me? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Peter Fisher is the head of uh, Redox Flow Battery and Stationary Storage Group from uh, Fraunhofer Ice Team. So, uh, just to uh, just to understand um, how the, 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 their presentation will match actually with the context of the panel discussion, is that um, uh, Ruben will discuss about uh, phytonics, we, which we categorize as energy efficiency um, cross cutting issue, energy system degradation from uh, Sager. I will explain us how uh, EMS is actually uh, making some uh, win-win situations on a grid level. And um, uh, Katerina from Solar Power Europe on uh, policy international collaboration. And uh, Peter, um, international cooperation, but I guess there are the flow batteries in the network that you present is uh, even beyond that. Um, okay. So uh, maybe first, uh, Ruben, you could um, come here if you want to. Yeah. Uh, okay. I see the font is not installed, but uh, oh. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, I'm Ruben Munich. I'm co-founder of Frightonics and also CEO. And today I want to give you an impression um, what we have done so far. Um, maybe I start with an excuse that the font is not the right one um, as it is on my laptop, but yeah, I think it will work. So we are doing, uh, we, are, we have developed a novel anti-reflective concept to provide a solution for the energy transition. And um, first, I want to give you a short historical background. Um, where are we coming from? So I started in 2011 at the Light Technology Institute here at KIT with my diploma thesis. And then I continued also with my PhD there. And during this time, we analyzed the plant surface structures with the aspect to how we can use them to improve the efficiency of solar cells. And as you can see on the right hand side, there's a small demonstrator, 2.5 centimeters square, with the structure of the rose petal on top. And the, the glass sheet, which is covered on, on the borders, it's not covered. You see it's reflecting, but in the middle, it's really dark and black. And also, the solar cell efficiency increased a lot. And yeah, this was quite impressive. But uh, as usual, after the PhD, people leave and most often the topic ends. So also I left for another research center and then I, but, but I, yeah, all the time I wondered why nobody else is, is doing this thing because um, the effect was so tremendous in my eyes. And it was so clear that um, it's an easy way to improve photovoltaics. So I decided to come back to the KIT three years later and founded the Phytonics company together with uh, other colleagues of this field. And yeah, but then it took us almost another four years to really reach the industrial dimension. So now we can cover the full size solar modules with our coatings. And yeah, well, so this is how it looks like on a typical roof. Here in the, in the back, you have a lot of modules where the light is reflected, so it's quite shiny. But in front, you have two solar modules which are not reflecting so much. And they are covered with our coating. And as you can see here, it's, it's on the outer surface of the module applied. 
and by this it's uh, suppressing the reflection. I will come later to how this is happening. Um, well, so our academic perspective was that we have to increase the power output of solar modules and we thought that this is a really good idea to enter the market. But at a, as it turns out, um, the side effect is much more important for most um, customers and this is the anti-glare effect. So um, since the light is not reflected, um, the modules are also absolutely glare free and this is a unique property which is not available on the market so far. And um, I wasn't aware of it that, that the glare is really a problem, but um, as you can see here on, on this photograph, the, I mean, in this small village here, oh, the, the resolution on this screen is not so good. Um, yeah, but only one roof has solar panels and they produce a tremendous glare and the view to this village is already spoiled. But what we want to have for the energy transition is that all of these roofs are covered with PV panels. And if this comes true, then with the current technology, this would be a real nightmare or nightmare. Um, yeah, so it's a big annoyance in neighborhoods and this often leads to legal disputes and also often to the deconstruction of the photovoltaic installation. And I, I think this is a very sad thing for the energy transition. And it's not only in neighborhoods a problem, but also around uh, um, traffic infrastructure, for example, around airports or highways. There, um, there are legal limits because the glare is really a safety issue. And with the current technologies, it's not able to fulfill these legal limits. And uh, luckily, our coding is able to be below this threshold of 20,000 candela per square meter of reflected brightness. And this enables huge, uh, huge area potential for um, PV installation. I mean, in Europe, we have something like 500 traffic airports and uh, tens of thousands of uh, kilometers of highways. So I think that there are the order of magnitude is something like 100 gigawatts of installation, which is enabled by this. So how are we doing this? We use a bionic approach. It's a, so we, we copy the micro and nano textures of the rose petal and apply them on solar modules. And these textures are able to collect the light from all angles of incidence and of all wavelengths almost perfectly. What you can see here. Um, in these diagrams. In contrast to the market standard, which is a thin film coding, which is based on the interference effect, um, our coding is really broadband. So the whole spectrum of the sunlight can be used for power generation. And at the same time, it's also angular stable, which means that even very flat incoming light, which is usually reflected to a huge part, is still efficiently collected and converted into electricity. So, and with this, we offer a very good solution for example, for rooftop PV. Um, since we, on the one hand, provide glare-free rooftops, and on the other hand, these typical glare roof sites where the light comes under flat angles, um, we can increase the annual power output by up to 10% over the year. Yeah. And well, at the moment we are planning our production line for small volumes like a few hundred square meters per week, which will then um, produce panels or glass sheets for PV manufacturers so that we can enter the market later this year. And yeah, I'm very happy that I have such a great team most of them are also, uh, yeah, or I met during my academic career, and now we are solving all these problems that we didn't expect to come up. Thank you very much. So, questions later, or yeah, yeah. Uh, 
pleasure being here and quite nervous also. Um, um, I'm Saga. I'm working as a software engineer in Fenecon since 2018. Um, I involve in uh, uh, system uh, software design, implementation, and development of the controllers, applications to control the storage systems. Uh, one such application is uh, using the dynamic prices or the time of use prices um, for a better integration of the grid. Uh, today, I will be talking about um, how we use the energy storage systems um, for the grid integration uh, through the OpenEMS, which is an open source energy management system. Um, so this is the agenda. I'll be uh, briefly discussing about the uh, the company and the controller which we have developed, uh, which is actually a end result of a research project that we have done uh, uh, with the collaboration of an, um, a Bavarian government. And uh, the couple of research projects that we are involved in and uh, our experiences based on the research. And uh, Fenecon was established uh, with a vision for a future with 100% renewable energy. Uh, it was started in 2011 um, in a small place uh, called Degendorf. In the span of 10 years, we are already a market leader um, in the battery energy storage system technology. Uh, we have a wide range of products, for example, uh, home energy storage, and we, we have also commercial systems and also industrial scale systems. Home energy uh, storage systems, which are in quite demand related to the uh, commercial or industrial, we are actually selling 2,000 home storage systems every month on average. Uh, currently, we are 140 employees and we are expanding each and every month. And we have a strong research and development uh, department. We have multiple researchers uh, with the collaboration with universities and the grid operators as well. Um, the end result of this research is actually used directly to the end customer as well. And one such application that we have developed based on the research was, um, and oh, sorry, before that, hardware is not the only thing uh, that is actually a strong point for our strong customer base in our company. It's actually the, um, even the software also. Well, I'm from a software uh, department. I'll say software is the only strong point. And uh, we have in-house energy management system developed Fenecon Energy Management System, uh, which is based on the OpenEMS, uh, which is an open source energy management system, which was made open source by the Fenecon itself in the 2018. And right now we have uh, 60 member associations. And it, this association is a network of uh, universities, research institutes, grid operators, and much more. There are currently 200 developers that are currently working on this OpenEMS, and I'm an active contributor in the OpenEMS also. And uh, we have multiple applications and the controllers that are inside this energy management. For example, uh, time of use tariff is one such a good example for the grid integration or controllers that are specific to the hardware devices, controllers that are specific to the, uh, uh, the, the customer needs, um, like peak sharing for the commercial needs and everything. And one such controller that we have developed uh, based on a research project is grid optimized charging. This is, this is a classic case example uh, where the customer benefits and the, uh, there is a problem for the grid, opera uh, grid operators. Um, for example, if you, uh, for example, consider a use case where a customer has a photovoltaic installation and the energy storage system. In a typical day, um, he charges the battery with the excess PV energy that is available at one point when the battery is full that excess PV is actually fed into the grid, which is actually problematic, problematic to the grid operator because at one certain point, grid operator is seeing no feed into the grid to a suddenly a, a, a kilowatt hour feed into the grid, which is quite a big spike and it is quite problematic to the um, distributors. And uh, this, was a, this was in collaboration with the University of Passau, Bavarian government has actually funded this project to come up with the innovative solutions where we can have a win-win situation to the customer and also a grid operator as well. And here we have analyzed um, the predictions and the basic research and how 
how effective we can predict the photo uh, the the production and the consumption and how effectively we can use this so that there is a gradual charging of the storage system and also gradual feed into the grid so that we can eliminate the spikes and this was such a hit this controller is actually a, a default controller right now in the storage system that we are selling in the home storage system so that that means every month Two two thousand new customers are actually using this. Uh, new customers are actually joining and using this controller. That was that. That's a classic example of how the research and the industry collaboration can benefit the end customers. And uh, we have done a couple of research. I mean, we have we have done many research projects. Uh, we have. I'm going to explain just a couple of those. One such uh, research project was EasyRes. Uh, which was enable ancillary services by renewable energy sources. It's a European Horizon 2020 research project, and it's a four four million uh, euro uh, project where we have universe, five universities and one industrial uh, SME, and also a grid operators were also involved in this, which are, which is a quite quite huge project. Um, University of Seville from Spain was actually involved in developing a. Uh, inverter, uh, state-of-the-art inverter. TU Delft, Technische University of Delft from Netherlands were, um, uh, were involved in conducting the laboratory test because they have the state-of-the-art laboratory there. And uh, University of Thessaloniki from Greece, they were the project coordinators and they were def uh, uh, defining all these research steps and how we need to proceed and further. Our contribution was mainly on providing the battery parameters uh, battery control, uh, control behavior and uh, um, control behavior on steady and uh, steady state and also in a dire state also. And also we, we were involved in uh, discussing regarding what are the grid services that we can provide um, uh, with the storage systems and also with the help of, uh, with the collaboration with University of Passau and uh, uh, University of Lancaster from UK, we were involved in developing a new energy management system on the basis of the existing open source energy management, open EMS, um, where we have taken a certain parts from the open EMS and we, we redefine the backend process of the open EMS so that we, we, we developed open EMS on the focus on the customers, end users. But in this project, the, the we have to focus also the grid operators uh, as well, where the backend system has also need to control all the grid operators and the end users as well. So they needed a cloud-based backend system. So we had that internal report redefining how the backend needs to be developed with the new soft software protocols and stuff. This was in collaboration with uh, University of Passau and the uh, University of uh, Lancaster. And uh, we have provided a battery storage systems to um, University of uh, Technische University of Delft to conduct experiments. And we have developed sudden controllers so that they can conduct a ramp rate limitation uh, algorithm test in the laboratory. And it was, um, it is, an, uh, they have uh, done a scientific publication also, which is under review, which was, which was appreciated quite well in scientific community. And another research project was MSIC. This was with a collaboration with University of Passau, uh, funded by the Bavarian government. So like I have given an example before, the controller was actually an end result of this one. The main core idea was to come up with uh, a certain novel charging or discharging algorithms to effectively use the storage system um, so that it, it becomes a win-win situation, to create a win-win situation. Uh, it's not just in a home um, home storage uh, environment. It's also on a, a public uh, electric vehicle charging station environment. Also, how we can able to effectively use the storage system. So we have we have come up with a lot of solutions. We have come up with a lot of research uh, points. We have also discussed regarding the pooling of storage systems and of, uh, how we can provide the flexibility as well due to a certain restrictions uh, from the government. We we couldn't go further and implement. Uh, that one, but um, one 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 good point was that we implemented an open data platform, uh, 
um, where we collected the customer data and we have put uh, made it available for all the researchers. In fact, a lot of universities are actually using this open data for their research purposes. In fact, CAD is also using for one of those research projects, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, so this was this was the end result of this um, uh, research projects, and our experience is, is quite positive with the collaboration with the research. For example, we had a better understanding of what is the practical feasibility. For example, we we might focus on a solution to a certain level where we we pinpoint on a solution um, where uh, it solves all the problems, but the practical implementation is not to that level. And uh, collaboration with industry is actually helpful in that uh, in that level if you if you think that in that perspective because it gives insights on the limitations. So that means that uh, you can have a structured timeline when you can finish the problem. And then it, it actually helps uh, the funding opportunities also if, you're, uh, if you know where, where exactly uh, the research product uh, is in, in, in what level and where in, uh, to what level you can extend it. And uh, Fenecon recognizes it. And um, we, have, we are into uh, in this research uh, uh, quite aggressively. Um, and um, we are we are into this even more in the future. Thank you. I want to mention this uh, this hard uh, parameters or uh, you know, the expectation between uh, you know the, uh, the customer and uh, the developer. There are a series of memes out there <laughs> making fun of this. It's great, you know. Okay, uh, I would like to um, jump straight to. Um, uh, EG policy just to see how sort of how Europe is um, uh, working on uh, EU uh, policy agendas and how uh, different uh, uh, people collaborate with this. Um, sorry, no. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. I just need uh, to share my screen. Uh, uh, it's possible. I think I requested to Francesca now. I will put you on the big screen now. Huh? <laughs> I can see that. A bit scary to be in a huge image of myself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. And uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation. And I apologize not to be in person. But uh, in policy topics, uh, it's uh, very live nowadays and uh, very difficult to, to move from Brussels uh, this week. So the reason why I'm in uh, here online, um, I think now I can share. Thank you for the um, allowing to share my screen. I hope you can see. Okay, so I will start it. Um, so my name is first of all is Katerina August. I'm the one, uh, the person responsible for coordinating the grids and flexibly work stream. And I'm glad for my previous. Uh, um, colleague speakers today here that uh, you tackle a lot of these topics and uh, maybe from a bit from a research point I will come here with the policy points that we are working on and because today this is energy conversion and storage days um, I'm also going to be more focusing on uh, topics related so to storage and flexibility and why is this relevant for uh, solar power Europe and solar industry and uh, going on that just a quick presentation, what is Solar Power Europe? So we are an um, European organization that work um, uh, at European level, but also at the international level. So outside of uh, Europe, we also have collaborations in order to have a bigger uh, deployment of renewables and specifically on the solar power. We represent in this way, a whole solar value chain of two, 280 organizations. So, so as you can see from this, um, the logos that we have and uh, the different industries that we have inside of solar, we don't focus only on PV developers, but we go from uh, materials um, to inverters, to storage, to utilities, uh, system operators, digitalization. So we, we want to have a vision of the, the full chain of the energy system in order to have a better support on how to, to deploy uh, more PV power, uh, power plants. 
Uh, we work closely together because of this, uh, and we our main core activity is on policy. We work closely together with th uh, 13 national associations. Um, and because today we are talking about here in industry and, um, and research, I also want to highlight that we work with research organizations. We have in our membership around 20 research organizations. So not just the ones that we have here on the logos, but we have more uh, behind too. And uh, our goal is to, to help shape the policy environment and to make uh, business happen in terms of solar industry. And for that, we also create uh, market reports in order to have a perspective at um, solar, what we are now and we can what we can achieve in the future. And also we design best practice guidelines according to, with the work that we do in several work streams. And for that, I can present here um, the 11 work streams that we have open on solar power. Um, they work at uh, policy level, market level, and, um, and of course, there is the need of having a support in terms of um, a more technical background, special now on this one that I've highlighted, the one I will more focus today, that's grids and flexibility work stream. Myself, I come from a technical background, uh, so you can already see that the need of synergies between uh, uh, a more research uh, background together with policy in order to support and advance on um, on having more renewables in the energy mix. Um, and then focusing a bit what we are working on solar power um, uh, in terms of flexibility and uh, on this includes storage and which are the policy uh, related topics that we are focusing. I present you here the topics that we have in the table for this year. Uh, so they are a bit challenged, but uh, they're also very motivating because we, in the last weeks, we saw a last advance with the new electricity market design reform, uh, supporting more flexibility to the energy system, supporting more um, interaction between the system operators on the grid and um, and renewables uh, developers uh, with a more open communication and exchange of data that we see that's very relevant to advance um, on the um, solar and deployment on, on the grid. And so just going quickly on all the points that we are working, uh, at the moment we are divided in two uh, main pillars. The first one is proactive action. So what is this? It's actions that we ourselves organize uh, um, from a policy perspective that we see that there is needed of, of more detailed discussion and, uh, and we'll come up with suggestions and best practice on a policy moral regulation perspective, but uh, of course they, they have to have as a basis also support of a more technical and uh, research part behind. And for that, we also request our support from our members. Regarding uh, so um, grid connections, network planning, and um, and management, and also bringing more flexibility to the grid, we are at the moment working with another association, Aeroelectric, on uh, three sets of roundtables where we want to bring um, several parts of uh, the solar industry together with the DSOs and uh, and let's say. Um, on the same table discuss together what what are the last points that we need to advance in order to to facilitate the connection the management on order to have less uh, congestion uh, management on the grid uh, less congestion on the grid and more flexibility and with this have more support of storage or demand side solutions then we have also um we are looking at hybrid systems so not just solar and storage but also solar and wind together plus storage, what are the benefits and the challenge in terms of uh, regulations and the barriers that uh, are yet nowadays uh, on that point or what we need to advance in terms of policy regarding these kinds of systems, taking in advantage the technical part that we already see of having this conversion of um, solar and wind coming together with the support of, of storage. And then grid tariffs, uh, what are the current uh, uh, structure of grid tariffs? Uh, from the regulation part, there is an update from two to two years uh, from ACER on, on this regulation. And we also want to be on the top of that because um, there is still a need of some support 
regarding uh, solar with the uh, storage collocated. Uh, so we also discussing this with our membership. And then we also uh, looking at uh, energy storage deployment. And here we are actively working uh, with other two or other three organizations. So the um, East the Energy Storage Organization, Wind Power, so representative from uh, the wind uh, energy uh, generation, and then uh, breakthrough that um, it comes together with it, these three organizations and also bring uh, a more um, overview perspective of the energy storage industry. And how can they support more flexibility in the grid and integration of renewables and um, less generation from um, fossil fuels in order for us to achieve a 24-7 uh, renewables generation. Um, then a more uh, uh, reactive actions. So these are actions that react to what is uh, being done in terms of regulation at European level. And here the electricity market design uh, that we have been discussing a lot since the last year with our members. What we do is uh, we have a more um, so no uh, not so active uh, action in the terms of we design the action itself, but to react to ac the action that is designed by the Commission and react to the consultation and give the perspective from the solar industry regarding the consultation that it's open. And, and another two others are network codes. So here network codes are a set of rules that are designed um, by the regulation with the support of system operators. So the TSOs and the DSOs, uh, mostly um, uh, guided by the NSOE association the TSO representatives on the electricity, city. And here our goal is to, to give the perspectives from the renewables, uh, what, what is needed also in order to, to have a better connection to the grid and the, after the connection with, in terms of network planning and in terms of bringing more flexibility. And at the moment we have um, uh, on the table uh, requirements for generators and demand side flexibility. Then, Jumping a bit outside of uh, this policy topic, uh, how can we have this connection between the policy and the industry together um, and the research? So we see three streams, let's say we have the business part, we have the policy part, and we have also the research. And today here, I will bring you two points. One of these is a ATPV that uh, I would say that most of you already know about it. And then a bit just an overview of the international cooperation that we have also uh, on solar power. Regarding ATPV, the goal is, as the title says, it's to bring together research and industry experts. And from that, uh, we are part of the security together with WIP Renewable Energies. Um, it's my colleague working uh, on this part where they have at the moment six working groups. Um, to keep the same topic and discussion, I'm focusing more on digital PV and grids, uh, where the goal is to have this energy of what we are doing on the solar power in terms of policy and the synergies that we also see at the research level, what, what um, on the research uh, it's being developed and how can we uh, make this um, this connection between what is the current nowadays business on the industry uh, side and what is needed to do in terms of innovation. So through projects, the or to ATPV that is um, itself, it's a project, but the goal is to create kind of red maps and other more future perspective of things how they will advance. So it's with the support, of course, what is the current situation on industry and the, and the policy topics. And here we have uh, at the table four challenge. I will not go in detail on this. We can go on the discussion. But just for you to have a notion and you see the synergies between what I talked before and these four topics. And then uh, I also invite you, of course, um, if you want to be a part of TPVNI, just to for you to be aware, um, this is a project that is always uh, welcoming uh, people to get involved, um, special on the working groups. Um, it's always a very... Um, it's uh, very important to have as much as perspectives at the European level as possible and different use cases coming to, to discussion. So we always invite you and also in, if you want to have a bit of a better scope on what is a TPV, you can also invite it to the conference on May 
this year in Brussels. So jumping quickly to solar European international cooperation, just to have an, a, a quick perspective about this. We, so we don't operate just at European level. We also support projects at, um, at international level, so outside of Europe and these are our cooperation partners. And this can be through a, at more European level to research projects or um, regarding international partnerships, we have also coalitions and councils that uh, our representatives from Solar Power are part of on the, on the, on the board. And the, the goal is also to, to bring the perspective of Europe, but also to align uh, with the perspective in Asia and Africa, mostly for now, not yet uh, South America. So Thank you. Uh, to turn. I think it's uh, this is the final slide, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this. And uh, please um, uh, remain online because uh, we'll uh, get back to you for the panel discussion. We'll continue the presentations now, and I would like to invite uh, Peter Fisher. I need to change my glasses because I'm nearly blind. <laughs> Second, I can see yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Fischer. I'm from Fraunhofer ICT and I'm leading the stationary storage and radar cell battery group there. And I'm talking to you about uh, U uh, European cooperation outside of, uh, let's say, standard cooperation, what you maybe know in, in projects and so on. So uh, FLORIS uh, stands for Network of Low Battery Research Initiatives. And um, we collect all uh, projects uh, which are funded in the EU on flow batteries. But we do uh, much more, and I will try to uh, tell this in the next uh, five minutes. I made uh, too much slides, so I will skip over some slides. Don't be confused if I rush a little bit through my presentation. Uh, like every, uh, does it work? Yeah, we cannot use this one here. No, does it work? Work. Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. So, like I, uh, every um, person who tries to uh, stay young, I also asked artificial intelligence um, to give you some idea about uh, the differences between flow batteries and other batteries. And uh, I asked uh, Dali E, which is uh, uh, an artificial image creator, uh, what is a um, lithium ion battery and what is a flow battery. And you see that the collective of the internet, which is feeding uh, this artificial intelligence, knows very well what a lithium ion battery is, but it has some difficulties defining what a flow battery is. <laughs> so um, for this uh, today's talk, you don't really need to know what a flow battery is. So you can be as innocent as Dali or the collective of the internet. You only have to know what a flow battery does and in which market is addressed. So um, in most energy markets, this right part is maybe a, a simplification of the energy markets. Um, we know very well uh, for short term, uh, or it's very defined for short term uh, storage solutions. But if we go to longer storage up to one day or even longer, the markets are not so defined as well as the, for the very short, very super short duration, because um, at the moment, these markets are for free because they are covered by either generation or uh, conventional uh, generation. Uh, but we have to think um, these markets new, I think, in the, uh, in the future, because uh, due to the transition, we have more fluctuating energy. We need uh, to have this market somehow um, yeah, uh, structured new. Uh, so we are uh, in flow batteries. We are working on, let's say, mid-duration energy storage, which we see maybe from starting from four hours to um, maybe eight hours, some people think even we can cover a day. Um, there we are really uh, in, in the line with uh, other technologies like pumped hydro and sodium sulfur batteries. 
Um, so we are really the market uh, is for um, renewable energies integration peak shaving. So uh, we heard a lot of um, business models for this or applications. Uh, if you look at the collect them all, you will see that most of these applications really focuses on this part of uh, our timeline of this uh, spectrum. But uh, um, of course, um, we have to see that um, um, for many years, energy was really cheap. So um, being on the grid, for example, with a large storage was not profitable. And behind this background, all uh, you have to see um, what I'm telling you about this network. This is important to know. So I will skip this phase where I show you what a flow battery is. So <laughs> uh, let's come directly to our network. So um, we are uh, an, a loose network of uh, at the moment 50 new funded uh, research projects and we were created during um, a program of the EU which is uh, the Horizon Result Booster program. Um, this uh, program was designed to facilitate exploitation um, and one of the first step is uh, let's say uh, create an interest group and out of this interest group our network grew and um, uh, when I show you what we have done so far, uh, you will see that uh, this was actually not aimed by this, uh, <laughs> by this program, but uh, it's very interesting what we have achieved so far. So uh, what we aim to do is of course, um, provide a networking platform for these projects. We um, want to increase the visibility on the impact of low battery research uh, through outreach activities or shared social media platform. And also we organize cross topic activities and about this, I will tell you a little bit more. Uh, but what we have to know is we are a loose group of these projects. They have all a different impact. We don't have a structure. We don't have, we are not an association. We are just an interest group who meet uh, every month and uh, discuss uh, what we could do. So if uh, one project has an initiative, they can bring it forward and look for collaborators. This is the only, so it's an exchange group. We meet each month and uh, each half a year, we also uh, meet with uh, national networks to inform them about our activities and collect their activities. The idea is really in the uh, sense what the EU wants, that we really uh, collaborate, that we don't reinvent, uh, reinvent the wheel every time anew, and that we align our strategies. And especially for flow batteries, this is important because we are a small um, uh, innovative storage technology. We have a, a big market of uh, lithium ion batteries. We are a very small developing market. And uh, many years uh, we saw also that um, we are not uh, really recognized. So there was really a necessity to align and to, yeah, to, to, to strengthen ourselves. Uh, that competition within the research groups is uh, the worst case what we can have, especially when you are small and we are not so um, well known. Yeah? So this is of course a list I will uh, elucidate. We started actually with a conference for PhD students. This was our first activity, what we did in Flores in 2021. So this is a, a usual collaboration topic where um, we collected all the inputs of the PhD students in the different projects. This was very nice, but it was follow up by um, um, uh, workshops on collaborations where we uh, the different projects um, uh, showed um, yeah, how we could potentially on the technological level. Uh, so you already see here some names of projects like Sonar, Compat, Son uh, Valid. These were all um, projects funded in the LCBAT call. And um, so we already started here to collaborate on a, let's say, technical level. We also made uh, internal workshops on different topics like electrode kinetics or membranes. So this was uh, interesting, but this is, I think, what every group does. The next step what we did is we um, went into policies and this has to do with, um, as I said, that um, let's say three years ago, uh, energy storage on the longer duration was not really recognized. This was a time when McKinsey 
they are that uh, we only need one battery technology like uh, iron phosphate batteries and all the other technologies are irrelevant. So in this environment, we created some idea we need to educate better on this technology and we wrote a, a policy brief which we validated in a workshop which had three um, main components. One was material research, one was road mapping where we thought flow batteries are always excluded or overlooked. And also one for where we uh, said we need more maybe demonstration projects. And in two, uh, September 2021, 20, uh, uh, we released this policy brief uh, where we give some background about the technology, the markets, and uh, about these three uh, topics, what we see um, the research needs and challenges uh, you know, uh, for research. But we went on. So uh, we also um, tried to put, create more outreach. We um, uh, participated in some EU activities like the EU Sustainable Energy Week or the Battery Innovation Days. For example, for the EU Sustainability Energy Week, we started with uh, collecting KPIs and map them. This is also now uh, to, uh, tomorrow on the stories workshop, we also work on this. So it's a very uh, interesting task. For example, we showed that uh, um, the, uh, even though we have uh, 10 times lower energy density on container level uh, in a small scale, we can definitely show that on the large scale, we have an even or even better uh, area footprint. And this is really the important key performance indicator for station, uh, stationary storage. We also showed, uh, for example, that if you look at uh, sustainability, if you make a weighted criticality, where you really um, define the criticality on the, the mass of uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, then you see that, um, for example, uh, each technology <laughs> needs to work on recycling, but for example, LFP could be, for example, um, a, a much less uh, favored solution because um, uh, you ha really have to um, have more critical material and there we have less uh, recycling strategies at the moment in place. We really have to work this. In vanadium redox flow battery, for example, we can reduce the criticality by uh, better recycling measures and luckily this is quite easy for flow batteries. The next thing what we do is from the, also the sustainability reasons uh, was that we also um, looked uh, into the uh, roadmaps and we saw that in battery 2030 plus roadmap, there was a statement about the bad environmental footprint of flow batteries. And um, we uh, thought there need to be a revision or correction. So we wrote a statement for this, which was also accepted by battery 2030 plus roadmap. And, uh, but we also saw that LCA is an important topic and that um, uh, there is really a difficulty in really look uh, in a good comparative way. For example, in flow batteries, we uh, make our carbon electrodes uh, ourselves. So we, we use a lot of energy to do this, but in, in, in lithium ion batteries, you grind up uh, natural reserves of, of graphite. So how do you weigh this out? So this is really important. And so we thought it's really good to be active in, the, in this activity. So we wrote, uh, wrote a review on the opinion piece uh, where we collected all the um, information given out in the literature so far um, and um, make some critical points also how and give also some our idea or definition, collective idea, how uh, LCA should be on new system, new flow battery system and what, yeah. And we also advertise to create a product environmental footprint standard for stationary storage, especially for flow batteries, because we think this will be really important to standard, standardize this. Uh, and uh, this directly relates to um, our last activity where we looked at um, the battery passport. Uh, this uh, was created without, uh, an, let's say, knowledge of the flow battery community. We just by chance uh, uh, noticed uh, that uh, um, these uh, activities were planned in the battery regulation. And so, uh, uh, but flow batteries were actually first time excluded from this uh, regulation. We thought it would be really 
bad if there is a regulation defining sustainability that we, and we claim we are a sustainable solution to be outside of this mechanism. So we uh, lobbied for this and made also an online workshop on um, what can academia do to create a battery passport for flow batteries where we invited also people from the lithium world to give us best practice examples. And uh, this will be handed over now to more the industry association flow batteries Europe. Uh, which will be in making now a complementary workshop, what can industry do for um, this uh, integration in the battery regulation. And it has been also uh, acknowledged by the Commission that other that this um, legislation should be open for other uh, storage uh, technologies or battery technologies. Um, the last thing is, of course, uh, I want to advertise for Friday, uh, Thursday, where we have this uh, workshop for hybrid energy storage, where uh, also, Flores projects will um, uh, yeah, support this action and uh, so KIT, the organizer, uh, we, uh, we are luckily that uh, uh, they will also have an industry visit at our site and we all invite you to join uh, this workshop on Thursday and learn more about Flow Battery than the real technology, not only what it does. Thank you very much. That's a picture. And actually, I have a um, uh, first question. Mm -hmm. It's uh, maybe I can uh, have it as a follow up uh, to you. Uh, do you participate in the uh, partners in this or the partnership? Yeah. So, um, so uh, we have members in our consortium who are in uh, BEPA and in your uh, batteries Europe. So we are, but I always advertise <laughs> that we should be more. <laughs> so it's always uh, difficult because, uh, of course, we are uh, not uh, a lobby group. So we are all scientists mostly, <laughs> so or outreach people. So it's uh, uh, really difficult to um, get a slice of time for this very important work. But luckily, we have some people uh, from Flow Batteries there. But I always advertise in our meetings we need to be more. Someone has to be uh, uh, put a, uh, a slice of their time into these efforts because it really makes a difference and it's uh, important because they create also the roadmaps where that uh, relates then later into funding. Yeah? And we were uh, complaining in the first funding round. So we had this big LC bud pause where we uh, had a lot of low battery projects, but then there was nothing and we were mm -hmm. worried about our technology is forgotten. So that's why we also wrote this technology brief. But now uh, um, there is this opportunity. And I think this is also one of the motivations this, this group was created yeah? to get yeah. attention and also to say, yeah, we, we offer a solution. We don't think that we are the only solution and there are also a lot of applications. That should be represented and uh, given equal importance and uh, yeah. scrutiny, let's say, on uh, what can offer. Uh, yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, from our side, uh, you know, uh, Batteries Europe, um, there, there are different working groups and uh, task forces. Mm -hmm. uh, we manage uh, the latter ones mm -hmm. uh, from our side. Um, I don't know uh, in what extent um, people, uh, the, uh, the partners in other, um, on the Flores network uh, are representing uh, Redux Law uh, batteries within Batteries Europe, but they will soon um, um, invite external experts to all of these um, different structures. And uh, I have put your email as a Perfect, yes. contact person to Flores <laughs> Network. Very welcome, and I will also distribute it to the whole network. And uh, we will definitely find it. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, is there any question from uh, the audience to any of um, the panelists? Otherwise, I have several ones. Uh, I see a hand uh, down there on the left. Safia from the local energy provider. Um, thanks a lot um, for the kind of efforts, uh, for putting the efforts in order to write the energy journal. I have a question particularly to Saga. Um, 
you have to you have spoken about that. Um, where are you on the component side or on the system? That's the first question. But I have to get it. Um, before we were completely dependent on uh, China, um, the PYD batteries, and then we later have our own r and section. We designed the batteries, and now we are actually giving orders from our side how it needs to be done. But the manufacturing is actually done from China itself. But we are uh, right in the uh, design and development section. It means that the open EMS, what you are using, you are contributing the battery management. Uh, the BMS is actually quite different from EMS. Um, BMS is actually uh, uh, is an inbuilt inbuilt component of a battery source system. So these are the typical um, management system that actually takes care of um, any operation that has to be done within 500 milliseconds. These are quite safety standard uh, management system. EMS is actually a higher level uh, management system. We deploy it on a edge side like a raspberry or a modbus uh, mod or something like that. And uh, we we install in this one um, the open EMS and we attach it to the solar system, which actually controls the solar system. So so basically it's a much from the peak. So it means that you are cutting down the peak, you know, I mean like you're taking the complete system, you're analyzing the system and cutting down the peak of particular or say at a particular hour using the program. Um, each not exactly particular hover. I mean, there are there are applications for that, but also, uh, I if I'm not wrong, you're referring to the example which I have shown. Okay, uh, this is not hourly basis. This is on a per second basis. So I analyze it uh, based on okay, my based on the predictions, I have enough PV production, and these are the consumption. So if I, I don't have to charge it completely, I can uh, feed into the grid. And also, I can charge in, uh, charge into the solar system on a 50-50 basis or a 60-50 basis based on the predictions, and then I gradually charge it so that I reach 100% solar system uh, SOC at at our target time. We have a target time for that based on the prediction. So based on that one, it gradually charges and discharges. Okay, so the target is the battery. The battery is lower charging. The the hour based on the predictions. So based on this, I have. Been Yes, go ahead. Yeah, because uh, I found her topic quite interesting. Uh, she talked about grid codes on the generation side, on the demand side. So I'm, I'm, I'm maybe you guys can correct me because I know that um, uh, the state of the art on the generation side, uh, the state of the art on the generation side is quite very really advanced with respect to grid codes. While the demand side is definitely uh, uh, there's a loophole. Uh, I've seen both the questions being addressed. Um, so it's also quite a question of understanding where you want to go back. It's, so it's just, just an open. So it's, um, it, it's about the focus or uh, where um, where more effort will be put, or it's yeah, a merely technical question. Yes. Yeah, uh, she showed that um, there are two work packages. One yeah, yeah, yeah. The generation side on the, on the demand side. And my question is do you really want, want to work again on the generation side because there are other institutes like VDI? Uh, the German Association of um, Electrical or Energy Engineers, or whoever it is, they have share of the art codes, network codes. So, do you want to rework? Is the question what I would like to raise? Well, on the demand side, it's understandable. Okay, I don't know if uh, Katerina would like to. So, you can correct. Yeah. 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 I don't know if Katerina would like to take this question or. Yeah, I can take. I'm not sure if I understand the question itself. Uh, can you just repeat in summary the question, please? As a, to make it very simple, you you showed about um, two, you showed two work packages: mm -hmm. the network side and also the demand side, uh, or I'll say the generator side. On the demand side, you want to work on network grid codes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I can explain a bit. So um, the requirement for generators is regarding a set of rules and standardization uh, or harmonization that you, you need between the two, two sides. So between the generation and the, the grid itself. So to understand in, in terms of uh, grid connection. 
and in terms of flexibility, we, we are in terms of demand side, we are talking about bringing flexibility to the grid. So it's already at um, um, at um, network managing. So these are two perspect two different uh, let's say times on the process of uh, bringing generation uh, connected to the grid. Um, I'm not sure if this is answering the question itself, but the goal itself is, is the, um, it's of course we have uh, technical discussions, but it's more at the policy level. So taking a, in a, in a, as a basis, the technical challenge that we have um, and understanding that there is a lot of diversity at the uh, national level, not talking about uh, even uh, inside of each uh, country uh, on the, for example, the distribution side. Uh, so for you to know, in Germany, you have 800 uh, DSOs. So these DSOs need to, to speak the same language to, to have the same understanding. So the goal of the network codes is it's exactly for that, is to bring um, the full uh, chain on the energy system. So all the actors that interact on this uh, to, to be on the same page and uh, for things to, to work. So in this case, for, for flowing from one point to another. And, um, and this is why we need to have two different network codes because one is in terms of connection to the grid. Um, so we are talking about standards that, for example, inverters. And the other one, it's about uh, bringing flexibility to, to the grid. And here uh, we go a bit, so demand side flexibility, it comes also from the consumer side. So we also have to, to see behind the meter. So it's, it's, it's not answering to, to the same challenge. I hope I, I clarify a bit. Uh, well, partly, but thanks. But I don't want to take over the time. Maybe you can uh, follow up with her. Uh, yeah. Just the details and uh, uh, somebody else had a question. Otherwise, I would like to go to um, uh, Ruben. Um, I would like to ask. Um, uh, you you showed uh, the different. Uh, I mean, the efficiency that you can um, reach in photonics with this um, uh, thin film. Um, I don't know if you can give more information about the tests, uh, what were uh, that they took place, I mean, I thought it was in, in a period of four months, right? The, the performance efficiency tests, about orientation, maybe location and DNI, for example, somebody can say that, okay, if you bring it to a uh, closer to the equator where you have a higher DNI and uh, uh, or more, more radiation uh, that it might impact the the, the test of uh, of uh, yeah, the efficiency. If you, if you can elaborate a bit more on the on, on, on the process and the, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. So uh, we probably refer to the yields um, that I showed. So the additional yield that we measured. Um, this on this slide I showed the data based on four months of open measurement. Uh, but uh, to be honest, this slide is already a bit outdated. So now we have uh, significantly more time uh, measured. This was measured here at KIT in the test site. And what we are doing in parallel is that we have sent samples out to um, European institutions to measure the soil, etc., which we probably refer to. Um, and yeah, well, so um, I mean, in terms of tests, there are many, many things to, to look at uh, the long term stability of the uh, accelerated aging. Um, but here we rely mostly on our customers, which are the PV manufacturers. So they do the intense testing. Okay. So they, they, they are, yeah, they're uh, taking care of further testing of uh, the, the, the film or, yeah, on the PV module as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't know if there's any question down here, any raised hands, one, two, Stefano, um, I, I can bring you one. Yes. 
that's going on on this question. We did not mention explicitly how long it does the coding last. Yeah, and that's a very good question. And uh, most people are asking this question as, as their first question. Um, so the material that we have chosen is has a uh, let's say inorganic backbone, so it's intrinsically stable. With normal polymers, you often have the problem of UV degradation, um, but with this material, we, we don't. And it is known for outdoor stability for 20, 30 years. Yes. Angela, I have from Sierra. I have a sort of question for you regarding the end of life of this new uh, coating. Whether it, this new coating impacts the recyclability, the how easily they are prepared, and whether you are considering this circular economy context in the design. Thanks for this good question, sir. Um, I mean, the recyclability of solar modules is still a big issue because the whole laminate is very difficult to separate and to reuse the same components. Um, I mean, one good news with our material is that it's absolutely non toxic. So, um, if it's, for example, um, abrased by particles and going to the environment, it, it will not harm at all, it will be dissolved over time. Um, but there, there's a conflict because we, of course, want to have a very good adhesion to the glass. So we don't want to have an easy separation of our material from the glass. And I think this makes it difficult to really separate the materials uh, for the recycling. Yeah. Corn, I would like to get back to uh, Peter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a couple of questions, but okay, I will start with some of the most um, yes or no questions. First one is whether the network has a um, cooperation with um, experts and uh, or industry or researchers beyond Europe. So like, to have it on a global map, the cooperation and uh, redox law. And um, the second, uh, the B part. <laughs> Uh, what happens after these uh, EU fund projects are uh, finished, and what is your plan as a network? Uh, work independently, continue or, uh, together, uh, launch something, uh, another, uh, yeah, another scheme. And the third part, sorry for this, and I'm just very curious about mm -hmm. the third as well. Um, what uh, if there's at the, at the moment uh, at industrial scale at grid scale is there is any um, R and D or any application real time uh, application of uh, redox flow? And I'm just ignoring. Sorry. Yeah. So um, forwards or backwards? <laughs> the question. So let's start with the uh, collaboration. Um, we had uh, the same exchange also during our reporting meetings actually with China was a little bit slept due to, of course, uh, the, let's say, uh, development on the, on, the, on the political scale, but uh, in Asia still, uh, they are much more stronger and for that reason, because they have more uh, facilities, they have, um, especially for vanadium flow batteries, they have uh, the most uh, facilities to produce electrolytes. So they are very strong. And um, so we had a collaboration with, uh, not collaboration, an uh, exchange during our reporting meetings that we also report what's going on. They report what's going on in China. But since the last uh, year, this has uh, somehow, yeah, this dissolved. Uh, so uh, we want to connect with the US, but there is actually much more difficult, <laughs> to be honest, to, to get similar networks which for reporting. And also, uh, we uh, connect uh, each uh, on a conference, which is in the most important IPF. And there we, of course, connect with the American, uh, but usually our topics are too European to be honest. And the second uh, question, uh, this was uh, um, about beyond. Uh, yeah, beyond. So yeah, this is uh, something that really bothers us because our funding 
usually, especially from the CBAT calls, is now uh, finalizing. So this you know, uh, little project will fall out of this. So we already start discussing how we proceed. So we will, on one hand, uh, apply for cost action, but this is more for a network for um, next generation. So, um, but uh, we uh, think of opening the network at the moment. This are uh, maybe the plans or becoming an association. But I don't really like this legal stuff with yeah. it. So it's too much. But I, I think this the charm of this network is that it's. <laughs> It's an interest group, so everybody who brings in something and can find collaborators, and then they do it together. Um, of course, this concerns us a lot. And the third question is um, um, about uh, R and D and application. Oh, yeah. for the so, so, uh, of course, um, uh, there is an industry lobby group called Anitech, which is from Canadian producers, and they have, for example, an energy storage data bank. We can really see that already um, megawatt uh, installations are worldwide. We only don't see it in Europe because they are done mostly in other parts of the world. We are very international. So in Europe, it's really, even though there's a lot of R&D and a lot of startups in new technologies, the most installations are actually in Asia and America, outside of Europe. And you can see it in the data bank. Uh, it's really uh, quite um, up to date, and there are already several multi megawatt installations. So, and they are selling, and there are also, you can see also the planned installations, of course. There's not the reliability that they will be really built, but there are already several, uh, several really large projects in the pipeline. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? Otherwise, I would like to ask uh, Katarina online. You're still online, right? Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. So, uh, I would like very, um, if it's possible to summarize the benefits of um, any, uh, yeah, from the research community on getting involved on the activities of uh, solar power. Um, well, since we work in in policy, I think um, um, the what the work is being done on research organizations is helping also to shape the policies on related to solar. So this is uh, we have a big um, position already on um, on here on Brussels regarding policy and regulation. Um, the network itself is already very strong, and we've been seeing. Uh, during the uh, due to the energy crisis last year, we we grow up a lot, um, and the the fact that we also have a membership that is not just focused on the solar de uh, developed projects, but uh, the full chain of the industry on energy systems, it's also a plus for them to have uh, to be a part of the net network and to have the exchange on these uh, eleven work streams that we have. So it's also not just focus on a, a specific part of the industry, but we go from uh, raw materials to the energy system itself, to the sustainability part. So uh, I think it's it's very good, this broad vision and um, the diversity of membership that we have. And uh, this definitely, I think it's a plus for uh, for being a part of solar power and bring more the, the research perspective to the as a support to the policy that are being shaped regarding renewables and Great. the energy in general. Do, do you also have members of uh, SMEs or startups, uh, university knows? That's not thing, is it? Not, not as a most, we, we start integrating more relationships with startup, for example, on our summit um, two weeks ago, if uh, I'm not wrong already on the timeline, this has been a very uh, crazy busy month in a good way. Um, and, uh, but we, in a membership that I recall not wanted to be incorrect on what I'm saying, uh, not yet, but uh, they're also welcome to, to to come and talk with us and see the the interested on on them also to 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 be a part of solar power so as i as you said before also any prior questions that you have you can also come directly to talk with me and uh, i will also direct it to the right colleague in depending of the subject that you want to discuss and um, from what i present here in a in a bigger picture yeah, yeah definitely thanks a lot um Thank any other question from the audience 
I will not release you yet to go for lunch. You have to make questions. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I want to get Bob back to uh, Saga. Uh, you mentioned that you released uh, 2,000 products per month. And um, the other thing that uh, got uh, really my attention was that uh, you uh, implement your research directly to the product that you have sold to the end customer already. So it's kind of, yeah, of course, it's, uh, software development like uh, Google Nest is doing. <laughs> um, how, how do you do this in, uh, in uh, not in practice, I mean, in software update, I guess, but uh, what uh, optimization does it bring to the end customer? I mean, more efficient operation or? Uh... Um. Yes, more efficiency is one factor. And if you can show the customer that he's not losing anything, I mean, he's not losing any money, and he's, he's actually uh, benefiting the grid operators also, uh, then that's a win-win situation. Is is ready to agree for uh, any kind of operation. And uh, there are there are many customers. In fact, they ask us to test any kind of algorithms or any controllers which are not released in the market. To test in their systems so that they want to see, uh, they, they want to be involved in this energy convert, uh, conversion. Yeah. And uh, till now, we, had, we didn't have any problem when we were trying to deploy any kind of new controller. And uh, we, we, we keep the customers quite updated with what exactly it does and everything. So we, if we keep informed and if he, if he knows that he's not losing anything, then, then that's, a, that's a good thing. Okay, and to a bit uh, one more challenging question this time. How, <laughs> how um, realistic would be to adjust your EMS to Redux flow operation and uh, technical specificity? <laughs> um, the, the EMS, which is exactly based on open EMS, is quite modern and it, it's not so difficult also to be able to adjust the with. Uh, because I know what has been uh, done in the Redux group. I have I've met one of you, or uh, one of the persons who is actually involved in the project, Father um, Swami. Uh, he was actually showing all the details and stuff. And uh, trust me, it is not so difficult. It, it can be easily implemented. You can get the software from ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's time for lunch. I would like to close the session. Uh, thank you again for your attention. And I think the lunch will be served upstairs, first floor. Okay.